We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andrew, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Tom is back, but he's under the weather. Oh, no. I'm a little congested, too, but that's just uh, weather-related, not illness-related. And our thanks to Lee Overstreet for uh, pinch-hitting last week. As always, that's a big thank you to him. So here we are. Episode... Yeah, so I have to get on a plane tomorrow. Yeah, that's going to help. You're going to be the patient zero. You're going to be spreading it to everybody I will be. Uh, If... If I'm symptomatic, first of all, I don't actually think I'm sick. Ah. And so this last week, uh, aside from Thanksgiving, uh-huh. which was a thing, so that was on Thursday. Yes. The Saturday after Thanksgiving was my son was doing his Eagle Scout project, was installing his Eagle, Eagle Scout project, which is a playground for uh, kids at his local elementary school, cool. and he was building a picnic table from scratch and it had to be painted and a bunch of other nice. stuff yeah uh-huh. so the t- as of the saturday before that okay <laughs> the picnic table had not we had we bought the lumber for it the saturday before that so this was the saturday before thanksgiving i think Tuesday or Wednesday, a friend of mine came over and helped him, who's good with all this stuff, helped him build it. And he's been, you know, from, he's been painting and stuff ever since. So it's been this, like, big, trying to get my son to get this Eagle Scout thing done. A lot of fighting, a lot of crying, a lot of tears. (laughs) Uh, And then Saturday and Sunday, I had my mobile climbing wall at an event seven hours each day (laughs) that I had to be, that I got to be Uh there. So between Eagle Scout being installed on the same Saturday as I was sure. out, all you know, Thanksgiving, all the stress associated uh-huh. with that, uh, a bunch of other stuff. I think I just, I just, I'm just run down. Yeah, that could be. So, well, that that is how people tend to, you know, their their immune system goes down, and you uh, you get whatever has been waiting around for its opportune moment. That, uh, that could be so I will be coughing, sneezing, yep. and blowing my nose. Alrighty. And sounding like now, this. Will, so I'm sorry to all will, of you. Are, are you gone for a very short amount of time? Uh, yeah, I'll just be gone for about 20, uh, 36 hours. Okay. Less than 36 Alrighty. hours. Well, this this might be a double week episode because last week's episode still hasn't posted. <laughs> yes, it has. I posted, I posted it yesterday. Oh, I didn't get any alert, so I don't think it went up. <laughs> okay, shut up. I did. <laughs> well, don't do it now. <laughs> We're in the middle of I'm recording. doing it now. Okay, well, no, you, while you do that... Why don't you open the podcast? I shall yeah, do that. This ahead. is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. To get your question answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. That is our email address. Our website, of course, is avrant.com. You can leave a comment there. It's on the website. It says oh, it right okay, there, well, making I history. I always get a tweet, and I didn't get a tweet. So I don't know what happened. Maybe the auto-tweet oh, maybe was my, turned off. That's probably... Broken. That is, I mean, very, app has very possible at WordPress. <laughs> but yes, you can contact us in other ways as well. You can reach us on Facebook, facebook.com slash avbrent podcast. That's yeah, right. it's got the podcast on the end of that one. Because uh, yeah. YouTube is just youtube.com slash avrant, where you can see our lovely videos. Uh, yeah, you can uh, reach us individually. I'm Rob at avrant.com. Tom is Tom at avrant.com. And we're on Twitter. I'm at First Reflect, and he's at avrant underscore Tom, where even the podcast doesn't tweet anymore. So it's very limited tweets over at Tom's place. That's right. <laughs> it's a vast desert of tweets That's right. over there. <laughs> not dessert. It's not a dessert. Nope. It's a desert. There is only one S. As every week, when I thank our listeners for the week to become the listener of the week, all you have to do is support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is by going to www or just avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link that sends us to a PayPal donation site where PayPal will take your money and give us some of it. So we want to thank uh, Rafael, Raphael, Rafael, Rafael. I am I not know. sure. I know his shortened version of his name, and even that I'm probably mispronouncing as Raf, but... Uh... Yeah. Thank you. We appreciate the donation. Uh, sorry about butchering your name because I'm sure we did. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry about that as well. We also want to thank our 80, I'm sorry, 92 yes. patrons over at patreon.com. We have uh, Patreon is a, is a subscription service where you subscribe to our podcast and give us a monthly donation of whatever it is that you mm-hmm. want. So we want to thank our 
92 patrons, including Jack and Andy. If you are one of our patrons who want to be mentioned, email us and say, hey, I'm a patron. Mention That's me. That's absolutely right. Patreon.com slash Podcast if you'd like to sign up. Now, I have to have a sad because we had 93 last week and we went down to 92, but oh, that's okay. Sad face. I was uh, I was prepared for that. It has happened before and uh yeah, we're we're on our march to 100 by Christmas. That's our goal. In fact, we'll be mentioning something about that after our the rest of our listeners of the week. All right. So, if you, one of the other ways, I mean, this doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while, send us, somebody sends us Amazon yeah. gift cards. So, we want to thank Mike for sending us Amazon gift cards. And uh, so, thank you, Mike. I want to say that I'm sorry I didn't redeem the one you sent last year. <laughs> I, it just didn't come through. <laughs> it's, I have tried to fix my email mm-hmm. so it doesn't send all that Well, Amazon when you've got 5,000 messages, uh, even a gift card can get looked over. But, Mike, thank you yeah. very much. We appreciate uh, sending that in. That's, that's super generous and nice of you. And if you can't support us financially and you figure out some other way to support us, uh, telling your grandmother about us, making her your wife listen to an episode, mm-hmm. stuff like that, <laughs> uh, though we will have require photographic f- proof of your wife listening to an episode. <laughs> photographic, well, uh, that works for an audio podcast. <laughs> well, you know. Nowadays, you know, my photos used to just be photos, and now they're like five Motion frames. photos, that's right. I can't stand it. Mm-hmm. It drives me. I didn't. I don't know which one is the actual photo anymore. <laughs> How am I supposed to know which one's the photo? Google knows. Google knows for you, Tom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want Google to know, know that for me. So Damien has supported the podcast by ordering five speakers for his basement home theater from Ascend Acoustics. He went for the CMT 340 SEs across the front, a pair of HTM 200 SEs for wall mounts as surrounds. Uh, and he emailed Ascend to give us a shout out, as well as Gurinder. Gurinder. He, he is confirmed a... to Lee and myself that that is the correct pronunciation. That is an awesome name. That's the name of a uh, post apocalyptic guy with a face mask and no <laughs> shirt. Gurinder. <laughs> Gurinder's the guy that you got to beat if you want to become leader of the tribe. Nice. Gurinder. Hope your kids get a kick out of that one, Gurinder. He said his kids listened and they were like, yay, dad's on the podcast. <laughs> You better listen to your dad. That's right. Because he's going to rule when the zombie apocalypse mm-hmm. comes. Everybody around you is going to be like, flock at your house. Gorinda, listen. My name is Gorinda. You are not allowed in. Only the strong may survive. That's what it's going to happen. You listen to this podcast. He's powering his whole house with APC battery backups. That's how he lives. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. So, Gorinda. Bought a 120 inch motorized acoustically transparent screen from Alune Vision, and he mentioned AV Rant when he ordered. He also got a kick out of Lee's story last week about early fire file sharing via FTP servers, which is how we used to do this podcast. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> FTP ser- sharing was how we used to send the files back years and forth. Ago. And Gurinder fondly recalls his university days when they had Ethernet cables hanging out of their dorm windows to connect all of their computers and also whipping the llama's ass. Winamp. That was Winamp's motto. Oh. Winamp. Winamp. Yeah, okay. Anyways, good times. It was. All right. Well, you made me say that in front of your kids, Grinder. So clear you, clearly you are as hardcore as I have surmised right. from your name. <laughs> Thank you, Damien. Thank you, Grinder. We appreciate the support. That's good stuff. <laughs> Do you have a sacrifice for Grinder? Yeah, I like that. Mm-hmm. All right. You can be Grinder. Grinder the Great. Yeah, that works. Speaking of Patreon, we have a prize draw. One of our Patreon supporters, Andrew, wants to help us reach our goal of 100 Patreon supporters by Christmas. And to help us get there, he's willing to donate a handmade collectible of a sci-fi themed model that he has built. He has a selection of available models. So once we get to 100 Patreon subscribers, he would like us to draw one name and he will let them choose which model they would like to receive from him. He shared a photo of one of his most recent builds, the USS Defiant from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. So this guy used to have a podcast or something. That's, or, he had uh, a YouTube, YouTube channel, channel where uh, he showed off the models he was building. He hasn't uh, kept that YouTube channel going any longer, but uh, he is still making these models, which this one looks darn cool. But this thing is legit, yep. man. Okay, so if it, it's, on, it's either on a table or on a board, and those boards are at least, I want to say two by sixes, but if they were two by fours, the thing from tip to tail is got to be like at least a foot in I think so change. yeah that's got to be got to be over a foot yeah so this thing is massive and it looks amazing it does that's good so work man I I would like to win it can I win it can I support the podcast 
<laughs> so, would that be a conflict of interest? This isn't the only one. This is just an example, uh, just a send in of the of the type of work that he does. Yeah, whenever I did any kind of model making, uh, the 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 actual like building of the model I was okay at, but it was the applying of any uh, appliques or painting that did not turn out <coughs> the way <laughs> that this turned out. I so. really love painting, but I I, I do, but I. I, I like painting houses, you know, mm -hmm. rooms. Like I started doing that a long time ago. I had a friend who was a a, a painter, and he painted houses outside, inside, all that stuff. And he was also an artist, but the way he made his living was by painting. So when we got an apartment, uh, and he came over to help us paint one of the rooms or something, and he gave me a lot of tips, and it ga just gave me enough knowledge that I was able to sort of you know do pretty well mm -hmm. at painting. And I really like it. But you're right, dude. The minute you get me, like, I will s straight up screw up a ma uh, sticker. <laughs> yeah. The sticker, the stickers, so it's like, man, that's, oh. they, especially when they're, they're like those plastic ones that aren't actually stickers. They're right. like, you know, uh, it's like, it has something to do with like electricity or, you know, uh, charge or something. And they just, and I have, I have the opposite everything. of a surgeon's hands. So uh, that's, that's not my forte whatsoever. Yeah. So we do have an announcement. We will be interviewing Phil Jones, the director of global training at Sound United on Wednesday, December 11th. Hopefully I will be better by yes. then. So if you have any questions about Sound United products, which include Denon Marantz. Yeah, Denon Marantz uh, Class A. That's the electronic side. Uh, Polk. Did they sell Macintosh? Nope. They don't have Macintosh. Not Macintosh. Uh, Polk uh, Definitive Technology and Boston Acoustics on the uh, speaker side. Uh, plus Heos, of course, is its own brand. So, and they're... There might be others. I think that's all of them, but th there might okay. be even more. But yes, all of those things are part of Sound United. If you're not familiar with Sound United as a consumer-facing brand, because you usually see their individual brand names. Uh, yeah, so cannot promise we will get to every single question that is sent into us. We normally try to answer every right. question first in, first out on the regular podcast, but this is an interview. It has a time limit, but we'll hit what we can for sure. Yeah, we're definitely going to be asking about Odyssey and Heos oh, yes. and the future of AV receivers as well as HDMI you know, 2.2 or whatever yes. the next and big thing when is coming out. And 8K. Their representative reached thing. out to us to set up this interview. They specifically wanted to talk about working with Amazon uh, Music HD. So, of course, that will be a focus. They wanted to talk about Heos. So we will absolutely talk about the things they want to talk about, of course. But uh, we will expand beyond those topics to everything Sound United. All right, in the news, Jan Zen Audio is a friend of the podcast. He's uh, David uh, Jansen. His uh, dad, I think, was the one who like invented electro right. speakers. And I, I reviewed a pair of his bookshelf speakers, which, if I remember correctly, were pretty freaking amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, he has taken the Kickstarter to fund the first production run of their new Jansen Lotus electrostatic headphones. Yes. Now, this is not the same as what I'm wearing on my head right now. Nope. These are fully... That would be the world's first fully self-contained electrostatic headphones, meaning they can be used with a phone or any portable uh, or home player, no additional outboard box, which is usually what happens when you have electrostatic Definitely. Headphones. All the other electrostatic headphones or earphones I've ever seen have always had an outboard box to charge the stators that are inside of the uh, electrostatic uh, diaphragm. They have to have a charge running through them. That's what acts against the magnet. So these are the first standalone electrostatic headphones where all that's coming out of it is a regular looking headphone jack that you can plug into anything. <laughs> So the Janzen Lotus headphones are a two-way design with a traditional 50 millimeter woofer crossed over uh, in, into the electrostatic panel at 250 hertz, which is exactly what you would expect because electrostatic panels in order to do bass have to be freaking huge. That's right. And even, at, even the, the floor to ceiling ones usually have a woofer still crossed over into them. That's right. Uh, at some point towards the bottom there. A rechargeable battery that they claim lasts for two weeks of active playback on the charge is built in to power the electrostatic panels. So that's awesome. Yeah. Excuse Big me. Bag. They are large and heavy, 50, 550 grams or one pound, 3.4 ounces. But they're designed with a self-adjusting head strap to evenly distribute the weight. Interestingly, they can be used either open-backed or sealed with a magnetic, magnetic back cover, which is probably the most unique thing i've ever said about a headphone <laughs> yeah ever. it's unusual to be able to switch between open back or sealed on a whim <coughs> uh so they, these have the option you make your choice so the regular price would be 1500 bucks kickstarter price is 1200 and they expect to start shipping the first batch of 220 units in spring 2020 they will only be manufacturing five units per day 
as much of the work is done by hand. So if you want to have a headphone that uh, even if it, it never makes, especially if it never makes a mass production, is going to be like one of the most unique yep. and uh, and probably highly desirable headphones that have ever hit the market. These are probably going to be it. So, you know, Father's Day present for me. Yep. You know, anybody out there? My birthday was in October. <laughs> can, if you forgot I to get, get into something, this. I, I am not sure that I would actually go wearing them outside. They, I mean, yes. You have lost your They mind. are headphones. <laughs> you, you could wear them, but these these are not small headphones. I would buy a dummy head. Right. You know what I mean? Like one of those, well, not a dummy head, but maybe one of those special stands just for headphones mm -hmm. so that I'm not just, because if not, oh, my kids are awful. I would, you know, put it in the little glass box shrine thing to keep the dust off of them and everything it would be a thing mm -hmm. well, anyways. so send acoustics officially launched their sierra duo lcr speaker model this is essentially a larger higher output higher efficiency version of the sierra luna the second woofer added to the raw ribbon tweeter for a mtm design with front slot ports 800 dollars for the center 1588 a pair early 88 that's right it's a little less than 800 times two Twelve dollars. Uh huh. Just just make it fifteen ninety nine like normal people. No, nope. cheaper. <laughs> so fifteen eighty eight a pair for the left and right, and with the front port design and being only six inches deep with recessed binding posts on the back, they are very suitable as on walls. Six inches deep is not that deep. That's pretty good. That's right. These are so not bad looking speakers. Either, interestingly, honestly. these basically have the same efficiency and output response as the Sierra Two bookshelf speaker. <laughs> That uses a larger okay. woofer, but the Sierra 2 is rear ported and about nine and a half inches deep, I think. So not really what you would consider a wall mountable speaker. So if you want the output capability uh, of a Sierra 2, but in a slimmer form factor that will easily fit below a TV, because these are only four and a half inch woofers in here, or uh, wall mountable especially, then then here you go. The dual LCR, LCR Sierra Duo. So... Do you know if there's really any differences in the crossover or any of that stuff from the, the center to the left to right? Because they clearly turned the tweeter, but did they do anything else? Because I wouldn't think they would have to. Uh, yeah, so these are have to be crossed over quite high because that uh, Rowl Ribbon tweeter does not play super low. I am not sure. I mean, David always... Uh, you know, really gets into the crossover design to make sure that uh, he's not getting lobing problems. Um, I, I didn't dig into all of the details, so I'm not okay, actually sure. Curious. I'll have to look that up after. Looks like they have keyhole, like, or some sort of mounting option on the back there. Yeah, with, there's with, a slot. Uh, yeah, the uh, threaded inserts are there for Threaded inserts so that you can... Mounts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can get behind mm -hmm. it. All right, let's get to the questions. Bob. Bob has a large, well, wide open living room. Their 65 inch Sony X900F will be mounted above a the gas fireplace. The front of the housing for the fireplace stands one foot eight off the front wall. Okay. So it's got some uh, depth, not quite two feet from the okay. front of the fireplace to the actual wall behind it. This is a gray column, very nice, uh, like, is that almost slate, slate tile? Maybe? Yeah, yeah kind that's of what that as, like. as the uh, fireplace fascia. Always makes me nervous when we start drilling the holes in it for mounts. Right, it's already go. got the TV like wires and stuff installed, so it's sticking it's out ready of it. To so go. somebody, somebody did that. <laughs> right. So bookshelf or tower speakers are a no go. So he's looking for on walls or in walls. Around fifteen hundred dollars or less for the front three. Pre wiring has been done that will allow him to put e to either put speakers on either side of the fireplace or to use one of those passive speaker bars with all three front speakers in the single speaker cabinet mounted below the TV. So what's his best option? Would an in wall or on wall speakers? On either side of the fireplace, housing have issues. And just so we know, he plans to have a subwoofer in the front left corner of the room. So so the entire thing sticks out one foot eight inches. Is that that's right. That I read. Yeah, that's that's the description. So that he the gave. problem here is if you if you put in walls or on walls uh, or on walls behind, you know, on either side of this thing. And is it in the corner? It's in the corner. right? Uh, no, it doesn't appear to be in a corner. Um, Are you sure? Yeah, I'm pretty sure because there's there's white space to. What's that side on the floor? What's that on the floor right near that? Is there just something on the floor? I mean, there's that a covering white? over top of the uh, of the um, hardwood floor. All right, let's pretend that this is in the middle of a wall. I think it, it is. Out yeah. one point. So, in order to put something on the wall to either side, you would want to make sure that the speakers were not basically uh, you know, the, the sound was not reflecting off mm -hmm. of 
uh, the side of this thing. So you would look at the angles and have to put them wide enough out where the speaker would be coming towards you oh, without their Yeah, that'd be very sound, wide in this case, yeah. Which would be quite wide, which I have a feeling he's not going to be interested in. So my best suggestion, especially when you start talking about wide open rooms mm -hmm. and everything else, is just get a you know, a sound bar that yeah. will attach right there to your TV. You know, they'll be all in one place. You won't be drilling additional holes into your stuff. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's not going to be best for sound as far as, you know, all that other stuff, but you probably have more, way more issues than whether or not your speakers are wide enough. Right, but the, the passive speaker bar solutions, and the one I'm going to suggest to you is Klipsch's. Uh, they're RP440 <laughs> Uh, SB, that's part of their reference premiere uh, speaker line. It is $800, so we're definitely under the budget of $1,500 that he was looking for. But of course, the reason I'm mentioning clips here and think it's the way to go in this case is because this is a wide open room where I'm assuming having the output capabilities and efficiency would be beneficial to you. Uh, I certainly do also recommend Kef's uh, HTF8003. That's the other passive speaker bar that I like very much. It goes for about $900, so also within the budget. But it isn't as efficient and a bit uh, doesn't have the ability to play quite as loud as the Klipsch. Does, so. does RBH still make those custom bars that you tell them how, the how Ultra, wide you want it to be? Yeah, they do have the Ultra in uh, RBH. That's, that could be an option as well. The nice thing about that is that if... If you absolutely want it to match up as far as width wise with your TV, right? Just perfectly. looks wise because it's it's just looks. It wise. is purely them adding the correct amount of MDF to either side to make it the exact right. same width as your TV. You just customize it. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's something to look into. Sure. You know, if that's something that you care about, your wife cares about, you don't want to have this little bar or the big. You know, you certainly don't want to have a big bar that goes wider than your TV. Right. So. But yeah, I, I think that'll it. work very nicely. Yeah, if you have the uh, speakers either on wall or in wall to either side of the fireplace, it's going to mess up your stereo imaging. Uh, that, that's pretty much what's going to happen unless they're really wide apart. And then that also kind of messes up your stereo imaging from the being that wide. So I think the passive speaker bar is the right way to go here. And there are certainly good options within <coughs> your budget. All right, Mark. Two weeks ago, Mark sent this picture of his Vizio E-Series TV that got knocked over onto his floor by his uninsured movers, we speculate that the zone of his TV's local dimming had been knocked out of commission because it had a gray box in the center, which was weird. Surrounded by white. <laughs> well, it turns out the perfect the perfect rectangle of gray in the photo Mark sent us lat was a test pattern, not damage. Yes, I did not know so, that. So... <laughs> Did not know that you could even do that. That's great. The damage to this TV are the wavy lines of light gray all over that should be per should be a perfectly white screen. So what do we think now? I think that when you take a picture of an TV, we often see those wavy well, lines. Well, that was just, this is why I didn't I think that that was the damage he was talking about. It. Because yeah. I thought that's just a moiré pattern that comes from the fact yeah. that your TV has a given resolution, Ultra HD in this case. Your... Uh, phone camera has its resolution so you're capturing that then we're displaying it on a computer screen and it's being compressed by youtube uh or our streaming software so i thought that was just a moire pattern that was uh the result of you know the digital photography and showing the image but if you're seeing that in real life it is still a moire pattern <laughs> and uh, we might recall that what happened when they dropped this tv was that uh yeah. part of the screen actually like came out of the bezel Right. And then they like physically pushed it back in there and you heard a snap. Well, your some of the screen layers in this TV have become misaligned. That is what has happened here. Because um, there are yeah. multiple layers, of course, in an LCD screen. Uh, when it comes out of the frame like that, it is not shocking that they are now slightly misaligned. And you are seeing a moiré pattern, which is exactly what happens when um, you, know, you have things that are multiple different resolutions or the same resolution but just slightly askew and it creates this wavy pattern so will that be fixable uh, i mean possibly if everything else is functioning i i don't see how you can i don't fix know it. it's i mean you're talking easy. about the, the alignment is you know my, these are tiny oh are tiny they dots. i mean this is certainly not diy fixable i'm saying could a no. repair shop potentially realign all the layers of that lcd i would be shocked <laughs> if that were the case i mean inquire I it certainly doesn't hurt to inquire if that's you could possible. show it to them and say can you fix right. it and they're gonna look at they're gonna do this mm. they're gonna scratch their heads and they're gonna stare and go 
we'd have to send that back to the so. factory and all they would do is send you yeah. a complete replacement panel that's very likely or yeah yeah we could we could order another you know basic panel and put it in right. there but you're basically picking that's a whole, a whole new, new TV, tv at that point more or less the upside is that you now know what moray looks yes. like so it you know if you've ever watched an uh something that's been upscaled mm-hmm. from a lower resolution to your tv's native resolution and it has like vertical lines or you know slight you know, horizontal lines on youtube yeah, well, let me see. I'm not even looking at your shirt. What is your shirt? What's oh, that? it's checker. Uh, it is oh, small yeah, yeah, yeah. lines. I have that's my more more going on. Even in yeah, that's more right there. So <laughs> you now know what to look for. If you, if those lines stay all lined up as they move around, well, then your TV is correctly upscaling, or the whatever is doing the upscaling is correctly doing it. If it's not, then there's problems, and that's what we look for when we're looking for uh, issues with scaling. But then again, we haven't looked for issues from scaling since. We stopped scaling up from, you know, standard definition. <laughs> but yeah, you basically. are seeing physical moiré. That is multiple layers of Ultra HD resolution, uh, the layers of your LCD panel. They are creating physical moiré now. It's, yeah, that, that's what's going on. Yeah. Phil. Phil wrote us prior to buying his gear, and he says he followed most of, of the advice. Well, let's see what he didn't follow All and right. why he should have. <laughs> He sits about 11 feet from a 77-inch C9 OLED. The theater is roughly 17 feet long by 15 feet wide, but it's completely open on the right, right-hand right side. This SVS PC2000 sub is in the rear left corner of the theater area. Up front, he's using SVS Prime towers and center. Then he went for an in-ceiling for his surrounds and surround backs. Plus, he also put a pair of front heights in-ceiling speakers. All of those are outdoor speaker depot, the ACE 670s. Have, we, have I heard of those? I don't feel like I have. Which have the drivers angled within their housing, and that's why I haven't heard right. of them. Uh, it, it's all powered by a Denon X4500H using monoprice cables and a Harmony Elite to control everything. All right. So he's got front heights, which are apparently about three feet in front of his couch. Yeah. He's got surrounds that are to either side mm-hmm. but above him, and surround backs, which are just behind the couch, f- kind of facing angled in because remember these are angled speakers that's right but just off the back couch and the subwoofer is in the back left corner okay yep just to, just to note his den x 4500h attempted to automatic uh up firmware update at one point but it had an error and nothing would get it unstuck the manual said to hold info and back and then press the power button to do a factory reset but even that that didn't work he called accessories for less and they worked with him for three days to figure it out turns out there's another procedure that isn't listed in any manual we're holding two other buttons which i guess apparently he won't tell us which they are while pressing well he did but i don't want to put it out there because it's only for this model so yeah sends the x4500h into a complete bios reset that takes about 20 minutes, and it worked again after that. So he sends a big thanks to Accessory for Less for their customer service. All right. So he ran Odyssey Multi QXT32. He says it set its towers, uh, front towers to large, but all of his other speakers to small. It gave them a mix of 60, 80, and 90 hertz crossovers. He knew to manually set his his towers to small, but what are the optimal crossover frequencies? Uh, SVS sends has sent them 10 hertz higher than the 3 dB spec of the speakers, but would that mean all of his speakers would be set to 60 hertz? What should he do? Uh what I do, well, first of all, you're there's a lot of stuff going on here. Right. But, I mean, well, uh, as far, can we talk about... As far as crossover goes... Okay, okay, let's do the... Yeah, question first. Let's the, do the, the question first. Yeah. As far as the crossover goes, whatever Odyssey sets to that, mm-hmm. okay, if it's higher than 80 hertz, I leave it there. Yeah. If it's 80 hertz or lower, I generally move it to 80 hertz. Okay. Uh, and if it says it to large, I set it to small, and I set it to 80 hertz yeah. because I am too lazy to sit there and listen to sweeps, which is what Rob's going to tell you. That, do. Yeah, so I mean, Tom's method, absolutely I agree with. If you just want it quick and easy, that's what you do. If it's Odyssey set it higher than 80, leave it. If it's set at 80 or lower, leave, put it at 80. That is easy and almost always works. But if you really want to dig into it, what you can do is play a sweep through each speaker one at a time and if you know your uh, all zone stereo or uh, party mode or whatever doesn't quite work uh, for that what you can do is just plug each speaker one at a time into the front left or right output because all you're doing is listening to the sweep at this point turn odyssey off just listen to the speaker's native output uh, have the speaker set to large at that point while you're doing this test because you just want to hear what it does <coughs> but play a bass sweep 
and you can just listen with your ears if you use uh, audiocheck.net space sweep where it puts a little squelch tone in every 10 hertz so that you can count the number of squelches and know where you are in the frequency range. Uh, once you hear that starting to drop off, you'll know, okay, the crossover needs to be set above that point where I can hear that the base sweep is starting to drop, drop off below that point. Now, whether that will ultimately result in better results setting it there where you've heard where the base sweep is starting to drop off, uh, you only have one subwoofer in this room. So we don't know that you have uniform linear base across all of your seats. You probably don't. It's nearly impossible for that to happen with only one sub in a room. So chances are you don't have wonderful uniform linear base across all of your seats that plays all the way up to 150 or 200 hertz. And therefore, you're probably better off just setting them all to 80 unless Odyssey set them higher, in which case leave it at the higher frequency. Uh, but yeah, that that is the in-depth procedure for figuring out exactly where each speaker individually starts to roll off and then you can set the crossover just above that point i don't i wouldn't go i don't by think that any any speaker manufacturer can I, I, even if they believe it i don't think they can tell you to set the, the crossover to anything other than very close to the lowest point of our speakers because well, sure why else would you buy speakers that go that low <laughs> if you're not going to use the speaker that low it doesn't make any you know it, it's like because that's the first question well if i could just set it to 80 hertz then why why am i buying a tower speaker that can play down to 30 in the specs correct yeah yeah, yeah you know, we're buying a tower speaker for a lot of reasons mm -hmm. um mostly because you listen to people on the internet but you know uh, sometimes you're buying it because you need the higher the output. output capability or just the form factor you know it, it, it's got a stand built in doesn't it when it's a there tower. are the, you'd be surprised how many times you're like i, I could buy a, a tower a, a bookshelf speaker or a tower speaker but the bookshelf speaker plus a stand is cheaper than the book is more expensive than the bookshelf speaker i mean than the, than the tower right. speaker by itself yeah you know so uh, and you don't want to know how many times I've opened up tower speakers and found out that it is literally <laughs> a bookshelf on speaker. On top of a with, pedestal. <laughs> on top of a big empty box. Right. <laughs> it it's doing happen. nothing. <laughs> but yes. it's fun. If you look at the back of it, if you look at the back of a, of a tower speaker and all the drivers are near the top and there's a there's a port in the back and it's near also near the top, mm -hmm. The bottom of that speaker ain't full of nothing. <laughs> it's just air. But I just wanted to mention about the configuration that he shows in his diagram oh, God, and what yes. he described. Uh, now, all of the speakers other than his front three are in ceiling. And what I'm going to yeah. suggest to you is just a configuration change. I'm not talking about physically changing anything other than you might have to move one pair of speaker binding posts. Uh, but what I would do is instead of labeling the farthest ones back as surround backs, I would label those as top rears. Uh, so yeah. I would have a five. I mean, five... if you look at it, this is what it looks like. It looks like top oh, rears, yeah. top fronts, and surrounds, but they're all in speak, all in the ceiling. Yeah, so, so I, I would have yeah. this set as a 5.1.4 configuration instead of 7.1.2. I would definitely set it as 5.1.4 instead. You will not have surround backs anymore, but that's fine. They're not really in the correct <coughs> positions for surround backs anyway, and they're in the ceiling. So they're really not in the correct positions for surround backs. So call those top rears, call your front heights top fronts, and leave your surrounds as surrounds. And uh, I would definitely recommend going for that because that's almost optimal, really, for what he's got there. You'll, you'll have the front-to-back panning of your overhead effects that way. If he had come to me and had just had in-ceiling speakers that were where his top, I don't know, where surround backs are right yeah. now and said, these are my surrounds, I would have said, okay, that's fine. Sure, if that was the all he had, sure. Yeah, those those are not in a bad position for surrounds either. Be okay. But yeah. because of the way he's got all these speakers set up up there, mm -hmm. I, would, I would rename them the way that you said. Good. Matthew... Matthew previously said that he has no plans to ever add Atmos to a surround sound setup. We said to go for the Denon X3400H uh, or 3500H from Accessories for Less since the new 3600H is a 9 amp receiver that can process 11 speakers now, but he would have no use for that. But there's there anything useful about the X3600H that he would be missing out on by getting uh, the 3500? So uh, small feature differences know. is what he's looking for, and there are a few. Uh, so any of the following, the X3600H, in addition to it being a 9 amps built in 11 no, channel right. receiver Talk now, slow so I can get some more. Will coffee. do. So that that is the big difference between the 3600 and the 3500 or the 3400. The 3600, 9 amps built in, processes 11. The 35 or 34, 
tops out at seven. Seven amps built in, can't do any more than seven speakers. So that's the obvious huge difference, but Matthew only wants 5.1 anyway, or 7.1 doesn't want Atmos. So the feature differences that the 3600H offers uh, in addition to that are it has HDCP 2.3, whereas the older models have HDCP 2.2. This is the copy protection scheme. Interestingly, nothing even 8K stuff has mentioned using HDCP 2.3. So this is future proof in a way that doesn't even seem to be necessary, uh, really, but I mean, if you if you want to be as future proof as humanly possible on the copy protection side of things, it does have HDCP 2.3 now. Uh, it can also use its Bluetooth capabilities to output sound to a pair of Bluetooth headphones. So that's a new feature. And if you really want to use Bluetooth headphones with your receiver, the 3600 can do that now. The older ones couldn't. The 3600 is IMAX enhanced. I don't recommend IMAX enhanced, So, but it's a feature. And it has the Dolby Atmos height virtualization processing, which is Dolby's version of what DTS had last year in DTS Virtual X. So this is, you have a 5.1 or a 7.1 traditional speaker setup, and you don't have any physical or upward firing Atmos speakers, but it virtualizes them so that you get a, a pseudo Atmos sound. So the 3600 can do that, and the 35 or 34 can't, so that might be worth it, because you're like, hey, I wasn't ever going to install physical Atmos speakers, even upward firing ones, uh, but I can kind of get a, you know, DSP version of Atmos this way with the virtualizer. Which is what the upward firing ones do when you yeah, kind of. So. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, those are the feature differences. If any of those float your boat, then uh, perhaps that justifies paying more for the 3600. So since he's coming from a 720p projector with HDMI cables that were bought at that time, we said that he'd need to upgrade his HDMI cables for his new Epson 5050UB and 4K HDR sources. We recommend the model price Dynam Dynamic View Active HDMI cable for his projector, but he uses wall plates. So will the active HDMI cable still work? The length of the HDMI cable stays. I mean, so the inside this wall is only 16 feet. So does he truly need an active HDMI cable? And what about short HDMI cables for his sources? Does he really need to buy new HDMI cables for those? Well, you know, this is a really easy thing to figure out. You buy the projector, okay. you plug it in, and then if it gives you an image, then it, you, you're <laughs> That fine. doesn't flicker or blank out occasionally, because <laughs> that, that's what happens. Yeah. If, if your HDMI cables lack the uh, necessary bandwidth, your image will flicker, or it'll dissolve into blocks or sparkles, or it might just blank out entirely. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty it darn nothing. obvious when you don't have sufficient HDMI bandwidth. That's just why I, I laugh whenever we're like, oh, I got this new cable, and now I, the, the contrast on my TV is better. I'm like, no, it's not. No, not that type of thing. when cables it's work. Not that type of difference ever. <laughs> yeah, when they work, they just work. Right. And when they don't work, it's not like they kind of a little bit work, but then they don't really. No, it's like, what is wrong with my TV? <laughs> it's not working anymore. That's the difference. So this is an interesting one, though, because... Uh, Let's say he has an active, so like Monoprice's dynamic view or an active HDMI cable. They have a little chip that's built into the physical plug of the HDMI cable. And normally it draws its power from the display device. So they are labeled, right. they are directional. You have to plug in the correct end to your display and the correct end into your source. But he would be plugging one end into his Epson. It would be drawing its power there. Then the other side, the side that says source on it, would actually be plugging into a wall plate on his wall which would then be feeding another HDMI cable that I'm assuming is inside the wall. Otherwise, why would you have right. a wall plate? That's going to another wall plate, which then the other side of that wall plate connects to his AV receiver, I'm assuming, right? So would the active HDMI cable from his projector to that first wall plate still be active? And um, I mean, I guess technically no. because it's drawing its power from the from the display, yeah, but, but going through it, all it, that it, stuff. It, the weakest link is the cable in the wall. Yeah, exactly, so yeah. you got to replace the cable in the wall. Yeah. And if you can't put an active cable in the wall, which is fine, I mean, it's only 16 feet. That's it's not right. a huge distance. So you should be able to get a passive cable, but you're still going to have to replace the it's cable It's still going to have wall. to be the one inside the wall because, I mean, he, he's going back. He had a 720p projector when he started this project and, ins and installed that HDMI cable. That is almost certainly not an 18 gigabit per second certified cable. Yeah. There's pretty much no way. I mean, they just didn't exist not your fault it's not like you could have known ahead of time so uh at 16 feet you do not need it to be 
an active cable. Uh, Monoprice has their HDMI cables that are normal, regular, passive, not active, that say uh, HDMI certified premium. And those are the ones you want. You want a cable that is certified premium, uh, 18 gigabits per second. And the length is fine, but you'll need to replace what's in your wall somehow. Uh, or yeah. buy molding to go around your ceiling. Right. And install it there or, you know, put it in the carpet somehow or around the, the bottom of the wall. These are all options. But you're, yeah, I would do what you're probably thinking you're going to do, which is buy the projector, plug it in, see what happens. Yeah. Uh, just be prepared to spend the money or the time. Yeah, the, the to... passive certified premiums, I would trust them up to conservatively 20 feet certainly 25 feet is almost always fine beyond 25 feet i would definitely want to go over to an active hdmi cable so if you do end up rerouting this cable outside of the ceiling and it ends up being longer than 25 feet even if it's over 20 i start to question it. and now if you're just replacing the whole cable with one cable why not go active at that point um so th right. those are sort of the links i would look for as for the shorter hdmi cables i mean I don't know if you just have a bunch of HDMI cables on hand, like a lot of us do, just sitting in a box, but they're old and probably not 18 gigabits per second. The shorter they are, the higher the likelihood you won't have any problem from any of your 4K sources. So as Tom says, just give it a try because it's obvious if they work or not. If they don't, then the 18 gigabit, like six foot length cables from Monobars, you can get a, a stack of five of them for like 10 bucks. So, you know. Well, I would I would get, uh, I would take your, your active cable or whatever cable you're going to put in your wall before you put it in your right. wall, I would... You know, plug it into your AV receiver or your source, plug it into your, well, I would plug it into your source and then plug it into the projector and then project something on the wall sure. and make sure that it works. Yeah. Then I would take the plug out of the back of the source, plug it into the AV receiver and then start swapping out that's short right. cables to From make sure sources. that that works. And once that's done, then you can take, uh, you know, out from your receiver into the wall, you know, or uh, actually I would then go from the source to the wall because you know mm. that cable is working, yeah. and then another short cable, you know, hopefully that the 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 brother or sister, the one that you just used, going from the ceiling wherever your your wall plate is to see what that. Because you have to like do this in steps with right. HDMI. There is no, you you really have to be super methodical yeah. about how you test. Although it, the other side of it you, is you won't know. the short. 18 gigabit per second certified premium HDMI cables are so inexpensive. Like maybe you just throw a few of them in your cart while you're ordering the longer one that you need. And then yeah. you have them because <laughs> it's, it's not a lot of money. Infinite Gary. Gary was reading Crutchfield's article, Learn the Language of Good Sound, sort of a glossary of most of uh, mostly subjective audio not terms. Not all and subjective. There's, there are some that yeah. are, are objective and can be measured in there. But yes, mostly subjective terms. In their section on dynamics, Gary wants to know if a speaker that would be considered more dynamic will also sound more forward, or if dynamics have any bearing on how neutral the sound will be. Basically, are all of these audio terms completely independent, or do they interact with each other? I mean, there are unique meanings for each of these words for each person who uses them. They are yes, well, yeah, terms. the subjective ones That's what for subjective sure, means. Yes. And when it comes uh, to dynamic as a particular audio term, that can be both because there is such a thing as yeah. objective dynamics. You can measure. I am inputting a given amplifier. I can measure the noise floor and then I can measure the maximum output capability underneath whatever uh, maximum amount of distortion I have decided because, I mean, if you're willing to go up to 10% distortion or something, then it's going to be louder um but normally you say okay here are the limits of the distortion for this test i can measure the noise floor and i can measure the maximum output uh beneath that amount of distortion and that is objectively the dynamic range of this speaker amp combo but you also see dynamics mentioned as a subjective term in a lot of reviews because it's one of those things that a lot of reviewers will throw out there as they want to like this speaker or they've been paid to like this speaker. And it's one of those things that you I can, don't want to say paid to, or, but well, they it's been feel, sent to them and they, yeah, they feel, yeah. you know, indebted or whatever it is. And it's super easy to say, Oh, these speakers sound so much more dynamic than my old speakers. I'm like, well, 
then turn up your old speakers because that's all dynamic is is the difference between quiet and loud that's well i don't usually review not usually in my experience reviewers who say that think something sounds dynamic they right. really mean engaging sure. and engaging has very little to do with the speaker right. and everything to do with how much you're paying that's attention that's purely to it. subjective or that yeah where your where your mood was at the time that you were hearing right. it or whatever oh, i haven't played this song in a long time i love this song I'm very engaged. This is a very dynamic experience <laughs> for me. So, yeah, don't, there is no, there is no, you know, like handbook they give you when you become an audio reviewer that says, oh, okay, this, when we say dynamic, this is what we mean. Mm. When we say, you know, velvety mid range, this is what we and mean. And even this though there are the essentially glossaries like this one, it's not as though every reviewer out there agrees that this is this is the way we're going to define these words. Uh, I mean, can these audio terms interact with each other? Sure. I mean, soundstage and imaging almost always go hand in hand. If you have a difference in the imaging, it usually means you have a difference in the soundstaging and vice versa. They right. describe different aspects of the subjective experience that you're having, but they almost always go hand in hand. I certainly wouldn't say that a speaker that is objectively more dynamic, it can legitimately have either a lower noise floor or can play louder than the other speaker you're comparing it to that can certainly objectively be the case does that mean it is automatically going to sound more forward or more laid back or something absolutely not that is the tuning of the speaker that's the frequency response and dispersion of the speaker that results in that forward or neutral or uh you know recess type of sound or something like that it has essentially nothing to do with the dynamic range of the speaker right uh so no yeah. I, I wouldn't say a speaker that is objectively more dynamic uh automatically has some other characteristic type of sound down. Maybe the reason it's more dynamic is because it's more directional. Everything is put into a horn and all of the sound that would have been dispersing wide is now being aimed at you. And so it can objectively get louder as long as you're sitting on axis. Will that mean the sound probably has a different tonal character to a wide dispersion speaker? Yeah, probably. But it's not because it's more dynamic, it's because of the design that created both of those facets. So yes, mm -hmm. things can end up being related, but uh, they don't have to be. Right. Chris, Chris heard us describe our ideal room dimensions, but what about a minimum comfortable room size? Chris and his family are house hunting, and his goal is to have a theater with two rows of seats, just a three-seat ca couch for each row, and he would be fine with the front row being his primary row at only eight or nine feet from the screen. He already owns a 75-inch... Uh, TV and a 7.2.4 audio setup. These thinking projection screen is able to get a dedicated theater room with with full light control. So with those conditions, what are the smallest room dimensions we would shoot for? I think my room is as about as small as you can get. Maybe it could be a little bit thinner if you're going to go with those 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 dimensions. But to get two rows of seats in something. Mm -hmm. Are you okay with that second row being on the back wall? Right. Because that, that, that's going to make the big makes difference. Makes a big difference. I mean, ideally, I would love, if I have two rows of seats, I would love to have three feet of space. I mean, I would love to have more, but three feet of space behind that second row. I mean, he's saying, what would we shoot for? So that's a little bit different. I'll go for what I would shoot for and then a true minimum, minimum, because those are a little bit different. Right. I think my room is what? I can't remember anymore. <laughs> I think my room is something like 13 or 14 feet wide and like 21 deep. Is Which is very is. nice. That's very comfortable yeah. for, a, for a home theater, I, even with two rows of seats. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to assume you got a three-seater couch, he said. Uh, those are generally going to be somewhere around 80 to 88 inches wide. I mean, most three-seater couches you look at are somewhere in that range. So I just went for the easy math and said, okay, let's say it's 84 inches wide. It's seven feet wide. If you put three feet to either side of that three-seater couch, so you have a nice three-foot walkway and... You're probably going to have some acoustic treatment or maybe a faux column or an on-wall speaker or something like that. So if you have that nice three-foot distance from each side of the couch to your actual side walls, well, that's a 13-foot wide room. So what would I shoot for? I would shoot for a 13-foot wide room. Now, let's say the room is 12 feet wide. Well, now you have a two-and-a-half-foot walkway on either side. Maybe you don't want... I mean, certainly not thick acoustic treatment on either side, you know, squishing that down to like a two-foot walkway or big speakers mounted on the side walls. But I'd shoot for 13. 12 is probably the bare minimum I would go for. Um, if you are sitting 
eight feet, nine inches from a 100 inch screen, that gives you a 45 degree field of view. So that's right in that eight to nine feet he was talking about. A 100 inch screen, certainly a size you could obtain. If you want a little bit larger screen, 110 inches, if you were to sit nine feet, eight inches from that. So a little less than 10 feet from a 110 inch screen, that's also a 45 degree field of view that I like a lot. So I'm gonna say you're about 10 feet from the front wall for your first row of seats. Your second row of seats, I'd shoot for six feet between the back row and the front row, because that gives you, you can recline in the back row, you're not going to knock your feet into the person's head in front of you. And then that three feet behind the back row that I talked about, that gives you a room length of 19 feet. Uh, so I would shoot for that. If I had my druthers, it'd be 13 by 19. Now, could you have a little bit less space behind that back row? Yeah, you could. Could you have five and a half feet instead of six feet between your front row and back row? Yeah, you could. Could you be nine feet from your front wall instead of 10 feet? Yeah, you could. So you Wait could. a second. So if you're sitting nine feet and then the next, the row, the next row is six feet back from that. Yeah. Is that to the back of the couch or to the front of the couch? Uh, from he like head to head. <laughs> so, but three feet behind your head is still like a foot and a half a couch. Oh, sure. So you actually need you need more of that. Well, no, because I'm worried three about the distance walkway. from the back wall to my head. Oh, I want, okay. I want well, three feet there. It's gonna... Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it's asking for a minimum. So, nine, No, I, I get yeah, you. 19 is what I would shoot for. You could probably make 17 work, right? You can sit a little closer to the front wall, scooch the front and back row a little bit closer together, have a little bit less space behind that back row. So there you go. 12 by 17 is probably the minimum, the absolute minimum. 13 by 19 is what I would shoot for. Eight foot ceiling is fine in either case, because it's probably what you're going to have. Nine feet is even better. If you can have a little bit taller ceiling, it is even better for the acoustics. But And especially if your back row is on a riser. Uh, you know, give you give the back row a little bit more head clearance, but there you go. Those those are what I would shoot for. It would be super tight in there, and it doesn't really give right. you any place unless you're going to have uh, your gear all up front on the ground. Sure, you're going to have it doesn't really have any place for your gear. It also, you know, it it doesn't really allow you to have a door at the back of the room. No, no, this would, would have, have to, to be a side entrance. A side entrance. Sure. Uh, so there's there's you know, I I think that 19 would be. Yeah, twenty one would allow you to have doors. Oh yes, <laughs> you know, exactly. All over yeah. the place. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, if uh, you could find a room that's thirteen by twenty one, that's that's very comfy. Yeah. He said, "What's comfy? That's very comfy." That would be okay. Yeah. So he knows we've said a square room is bad, but how bad and how square? How and how square is too square? Well, there's <laughs> you only know, one square. Well, close to square. He's thinking. What if it's six inches difference? Right. Uh, the, it's six yeah. inches longer this... than it is wide. So should a square room be avoided at all costs, or could its problems be mitigated with proper placement of two subs and with about four subs? Well, okay, so the reason we say square is bad mm -hmm. is because uh, all the th stuff we talk about with how uh, sound re you know, reflects off the walls and then adds to or adds to itself or subtracts from itself and it gives you peaks and nulls, mm -hmm. it's just exasperated by the fact that you've got two or th more dimensions that are exactly the same. So say you were in an eight foot by eight foot by eight foot room. <laughs> Basically, no matter what direction the sound, yeah, you were in the cube, every direction the sound is going in is... Essentially, the 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 as it's coming back, the the sound waves are going to start overlapping, yeah. the same way from all directions. You have the same which, standing wave in up, down, front, back, and left, right. <laughs> right. Which means you're going to have huge nulls and huge right. peaks. You know. So, you know, can we mitigate this? Uh, and, and how square is too square? Well, I mean, you definitely want feet difference, not inches difference between the dimensions. So if you said your room was 10, 10 foot by 10 and a half by, you know, nine and a half, I'd be like, you have a cube. It's a cube. If Pretty for, darn close, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the frequencies we're really worried about are, you know, 20 feet long. <laughs> and, so and longer. That's, yeah. <laughs> and longer. And that six inches difference is, you know, between right. the two is not a huge difference. So, yes, they slightly offset mm -hmm. than maybe they would, they, would, they would normally be, but they're close enough that it's still going to be an issue. So do we avoid it at all costs? Well, it, I mean, if you ask me, if you said to me, I have a house. With a that that with a room for a home theater, and that that home theater is a perfect cube. Right. Or I have a different house where you can put a home theater in this large open space with an area. And it'll be all, off to the side, and it's all tile and uh, you know wood panel. Oh right, yeah. Which would I take? 
Give me the freaking cube, dude. <laughs> Give me the cube any day of the week and twice on Sunday. I mean, Sundays. if you had an actual cube, you would need eight subs to properly work in yeah. there. I mean, we're talking an actual cube where even the height is the same as the length and the width. You would need eight subs in there. And even then, the very center of your room would still be either a gigantic peak or a gigantic null. And even the eight subs won't fix it at the very center of your room. But anywhere outside of the very <coughs> center of your room, eight subs could more or less mitigate this problem. Now, you probably don't have an actual cube. The height of your room is probably different than the length and the width of your room. In, in right. which case... Four subs, if it, let's say your, your length and width are the same or very, very close to each other, four subs in there, everywhere outside of the very center of the room, will largely mitigate that. So you, you can, you can do a square room, um, you know, means more, it means you're buying four subs instead of two. <laughs> yeah, if it's a very, very, if it's a very large square room, mm. then you can take one wall and just, or whichever one you want, and then just make it a put a false wall in front of it and just shove it full of insulation. Yes. <laughs> you know, make a humongous base That's trap right. back there. And the idea of that would be then as far as the sound is concerned, as, as far as how much energy is being reflected back, right. that dimension has been changed. Yes. So, you know, say you had a 20 foot by 20 foot by 10 foot room, sure. which would... Not be great, but you know, whatever. You took one of those twenty foot dimensions and you you put like four feet in, yeah, and you put a false wall there, and you just literally bought out Home Depot for <laughs> all of their insulation, and you just stacked it up in there, just stacked it up behind that mm -hmm. wall, right? I I'd be like, well, you only need two subs now, yeah. oh. <laughs> you're good now. So yep, there you go, yeah. No. <laughs> Eric on Twitter. Eric has heard us talking about uh, backing up physical disks and watching them in Plex or some other media server program. He'd like to start doing that with his Ultra HD Blu-rays. What disk reader does he need and what software in order to back up his disk? Well, I know the software is Make MKV because we talk about it all the time. Make MKV, absolutely. It is still free while in beta and it has been around for, what, over a decade now and it's still in beta? So I don't think still it's ever coming out of beta. Although, you know what? If you buy it, and you like it, and you use it, throw them some money, because they put a yeah. lot of work into that program. Uh, so The problem is the reader, though. The problem is the The, is, the physical is which optical drive, drive. yes. Yeah. Uh, and I, here's what I'm going to suggest to you. So first of all, there have been some changes since the last time we talked about this, so it's well worth asking again. I never mind reiterating stuff, because stuff <coughs> does get updated and changed. In the past, you had to buy what was called a UHD-friendly optical drive, which was a drive that could read three or four layer discs, but was not an official Ultra HD Blu-ray drive, because the official Ultra HD Blu-ray drives, the type that you would use with power DVD software to watch actual retail movies on your computer, those drives you could not use with Make MKV to make a backup of the drive. The firmware on those drives prevented you from doing that. So you had to get an optical drive. This is in the past, an optical drive that was UHD friendly. It could physically read the discs, but wasn't an official drive. And then you had to separately go out to a site uh, that Make MKV will Will not host these files. You had to download keys. There was literally an individual key for each disk that existed. You had to import oh, all wait. of those keys into a file within Make MKV. And you know, as new disks came out, you had to get new keys for each and every disk that you wanted to back up. So it was a bit of a laborious process. Well, Make MKV has now written their own firmware. They call it LibreDrive. They have their own firmware now, which you can update. They have a list of supported Ultra HD drives and BDXL drives that are not official UHD drives, but they have a whole list of supported physical drives. You update them with the LibreDrive firmware, and now you don't have to mess around with keys anymore. <laughs> That's in the update. It's considerably easier. But mm. updating the firmware to LibreDrive, if you're familiar with a little bit of going into command prompt and stuff like that. It's not super difficult. They have instructions on the site of how to do it. But maybe you don't want to mess around with all of that. Well, there are people right on Make MKB's forums. They are trusted suppliers. They will do the firmware update for you and just send you the drive. And they charge like $20 more than you buying the drive yourself and updating the firmware yourself. They're not ripping anybody off. It's very affordable. I would highly recommend, because it sounds like Eric has not been super into this until this point. 
Just right. go. Uh, I'll have the link for the exact forum topic where they talk about all this Libra Drive stuff and which drives to buy on that. Just go to one of the recommended vendors that's right there in the first post of that thread and and buy from one of them. It is it is the easiest thing to do. So that's the optical drive you need. If you have a computer that doesn't have any internal base, because almost all of these drives are internal drives. They're not external drives. Um, if you don't have a computer with internal bays available to install an internal drive, you can get an exterior case that turns it into right. a USB drive. So that'd be a two-part solution. Again, all these vendors sell it that way if you want. All right, Carl. Carl asks, what's our take on the recent bunch of headlines claiming that some shows, The Mandalorian in particular, are fake HDR? <laughs> uh, so have you watched Mandalorian? Yet? I have. Uh, uh, not the most recent How many episode episodes are out there? Uh, there's four I think out there, and the fifth should be three. coming out this Friday, I think. Yeah, I think I've watched three. Me too. So the third episode yeah. was good. I liked the third episode very much. That, is that the one that with Baby Yoda? <gasps> Spoilers. That's not a spoiler. He's all over the freaking. He internet. is very much all over the internet. <laughs> well, he was in the first episode at the end of it. Oh, well, he was at the end of the first episode. Oh yeah. Okay, I don't really remember any guy. I guess <laughs> I watched it with my son a while ago. And, I don't and by the way, the so. third episode, uh, the HDR looks considerably more HDR than the first two episodes. So I think yeah. this early analysis and calling it fake HDR might have been preemptive. All right. So quite Pretty a few true. tech news outlets use the HDTV test and digital foundry analysis videos as evidence that we are being sent fake HDR signals that never exceeded 200 to 400 nits. They go on to say that this basically SDR in an HDR wrapper uh that's what they call it mm -hmm. uh and uh, then they point out that potential downsides such as people watching this content as that is labeled as hdr or dolby vision for the first time and concluding that hdr is unimpressive or how tvs especially non-local dimming lcds will kick into high backlight mode that uses more electricity and actually results in worse black levels or how kicking tvs into hdr mode actually makes them look darker overall because users can adjust the gamma or backlight settings so do we agree that this is fake hdr content do we agree it could harm people's opinions of what hdr can offer let me just tell you something about these news what these news sites all right <laughs> this is like the the most the most backhanded form of elitism that I've heard in quite some time. It's like, oh, the huddled masses, they can't figure out how HDR works and stuff. It, you know, the reality is most people don't give two figs about they really, HDR yes. yeah, really or don't. SDR or backlight or contrast or any of that stuff. They look at it and they're like, and, and, and they look at it and they're paying attention to the content and they don't care what it looks like. They don't, you know. I've I've been watching. I've I've walked into rooms where I'm look. I look at the TV. I'm like, why is your TV so red? They're like, oh, that's just the way this, it looks. I'm like, no, it doesn't. I, that's not the I way this looks. I still see people watching stuff stretched, and they're fine with it. <laughs> they're just people are wide like that, aren't they? Wide like that. I mean, maybe in North Carolina, but I don't know about here. Sorry. Oh man. I used to. That was that was that. Sorry. Sorry, North Carolina. It's only. Only because you have all those pig picking places, mm. all right? If you didn't have all those pig picking places, then I wouldn't make fun of you. Uh, and I, I used to live there, so it's fine. <laughs> all right, so, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, you know, people aren't going to watch this and say, oh, I'm going to go take back my HDR TV and go get a non-HDR mm. TV because The Mandalorian looks like garbage. No, that's not how this works. All right. These same people that you're talking about don't own the Ultra HD Blu-ray player, mm. don't care about anything other than how big the TV is and whether or not it'll play football. And that's fine. You know what? That's the majority of customers that are out there. That is the vast majority of customers that are out there. And they can enjoy it or however they deem fit. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to come to this podcast and say, you know, everybody looks a little stretched. I'm not sure what's going on. We'll walk them through the settings and we'll fix it for them. If they are fine with it being that way, then they're fine with it being that way. You know, <laughs> that same house that I told you guys about many moons ago where they had that weird uh, backlight uh, or, or light sensing thing that would change oh, yes. the... The stuff I turned it off. I've I've been to that house three times. I've turned it off three times mm -hmm. while I've been they there. Turn it because back they on, keep huh? turning it back on. <laughs> That's what they used to. You know? That's what they like. Carl, I completely one hundred percent disagree uh calling this fake HDR. I even disagree with Vincent Tio, which I rarely do, but I even disagree with I mean his video is the one that a lot of these articles are referencing. Uh disagree <coughs> that this uh is not you know, the optimal use of HDR. I, I disagree with that take as a whole. If you are exceeding 100 nits, it is HDR. Full stop. That's it. 
SDR standard dynamic range stops at 100 nits. That's what it is. So 200 nits is HDR. It's brighter than 100. So for me, completely not, it, it is HDR, not fake whatsoever. Now, is 200 nits going to be the most spectacular looking spectral highlight HDR you've ever seen? Of course it isn't. Not when you can look at something that's 1,000 or 4,000 or 10,000 nits. Of right. course it isn't. It's not the most spectacular. Could somebody look at a T? The, the one I do agree with is the whole, you have a non-local dimming LCD. It kicks into HDR mode, so its backlight is on full blast. That actually makes the, ba uh, the black levels look worse, and it's using more electricity. Yeah, that, that's true. That, that's a point. And if you're not actually getting any more specular highlight uh, other than, you know, 200 nits, which is not spectacular to our eye compared to 100, um, yeah, it is a bit of a waste. I guess I could agree with that. Uh, but it's the director's yeah. intent. This is what they wanted the darn thing to look like. Not everything has well, to blast that. your eyes with 1,000 nits. And not only that, I mean, like, you're, you're like, oh, my God, their backlight is on full and they're wasting electricity. First of all, shut up. <laughs> and second... Yeah, do you are you assuming these people are sitting in a dark home theater? Well, is that what you're assuming? And that with their edge lit LCD, right. I don't think so. I think that's the I other side that's the same of it. Because I have to agree a little bit. Now, I mean, this is all a consumer education thing, which I agree is not the what the industry is not very good at it. They don't advertise it very well, you know. So the idea that they tell you what to care about, they don't care tell you why it's important right. <laughs> most of the time. You know, the TV kicks into you know. HDR or Dolby Vision mode, uh, and everything looks darker because this person was watching in a well-lit room. It For standard dynamic range, they had the backlight cranked up. They had the gamma turned up, so everything looked bright. They had it in vivid mode, for all we know. And now it right. kicks into HDR mode, and everything is where it should be by the specs. But yeah, it looks way darker than what they're used to. Their standard dynamic range, they weren't watching it at 100 nits. They were watching it at four or 600 nits because they had everything cranked up for standard dynamic range. And yeah. now kicks into HDR and everything looks really dark. Could that lead someone to say, I don't like HDR. Whenever it goes into HDR, everything looks way too dark for me. I'm like, yeah, I, I see where they're coming from. Yep. I see Absolutely. where the criticism that these articles or that Vincent Tio or that Digital Foundry were pointing out. I'm like, yeah, that's that's a valid remark in my opinion because that is that could absolutely be the case. Now, is it possible to educate all of those people about standards and director's intent and how every TV that monitor that's used in the production is calibrated to the same thing? And I mean, that's that's a tall order, I think. I don't think everybody's looking that up and you can't force it on anybody. But we have these other things like filmmaker mode. You know, you have Tom Cruise putting out YouTube videos saying, please, you know, take your TV out of soap opera effect. The, the effort is there. We have Netflix calibrated mode, right? All of these things are attempting to nudge the mass market into the idea that there are standards and it's probably not the garish overly bright thing you've been watching all this time but we'll and as much as it. i hate you know people putting things in vivid mode you know right. what i hate even more is when manufacturers won't let you adjust things to your <laughs> taste right. i mean my parents have gotten a new uh, a new, my, 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 my dad got a new iphone mm -hmm. so he took his old iphone that was trying to, it was given it to my brother uh, who's autistic and he doesn't really use it for anything except to occasionally call my parents and when they're out of the house. But you know, you know the playground that you know the kind of so the the play the uh, the sandbox that Apple forces you to be in. Mm -hmm. You know he's got to get he can't just hand he can't just factory reset it and hand him this phone. Right. You know he's got to take his old ID off, you know, Apple ID mm. off. And then he's worried that if that happens and this other stuff, all these other things will happen. He doesn't understand how any of, that's, any of this stuff works. And I walk him through it and I tell him, you know, this, you know, yeah, I understand, you know, you should be able to just wipe it and hand it to him. And then he should be able to use it with the new SIM card, but you need to put an Apple ID in yes. there. And if you don't, then, you know, so you have to give him his old Apple ID. And my parents are like, well, what about his YouTube videos? I'm like, well, YouTube and Apple are not the same thing. And yeah. blah, blah, blah. I'm going through all <laughs> this stuff. You have to log in to your Google account. And yeah. Yeah. It, it becomes sort of this, this, you know, it's a the, Apple's taken, yeah. well, yeah. I mean, my mother-in-law passed away. And when she passed away, her passwords went with her. So right. I have an iPad in this house that we took to Apple and said, listen, she's freaking dead, dude. Can we get this thing switched to our Apple ID? And their response was no. 
That thing is forever on her Apple ID right. and we cannot get it off. You can't factory reset it. You can't, you know, transfer it. You have to have the password. Um, so every time we open that thing up, I have to say, no, don't update right now because right. I don't have the password. And it's been sitting there for, you know, three years like that. Yeah, I mean, th so, this is the thing with, it, yes. with HDR is that it, it is this... Um, it's not the sliding scale that gamma used to be, right? The electro optical transfer function is this signal. No one understood gamma before this. Anyways. I know, but I mean, but come on. People could play with it and see that the image got brighter. Well, you can't play with it anymore. You know, this signal means this many nits. That's how HDR works. It's locked right. in. And now, I mean, for example, on the older OLED models, Dolby Vision used to have the OLED light level begin at 50, and you actually could increase it. You actually could make Dolby Vision brighter through the OLED light setting, which was akin to a backlight setting. But now on the 2019 models, OLED light is already set at 100. <coughs> the only way to make Dolby Vision look any brighter is to use a different Dolby Vision picture mode that actually changes the EOTF, the electro-optical transfer function, within the right. picture mode. It's the only way to do it. Now, there's no user ability to make it look brighter while retaining you know, the correct colors in that. So... Uh, this locking people into, you know, it goes into HDR or Dolby Vision mode and I really can't adjust it and I'm used to everything looking brighter because I don't adhere to 100 nits in SDR. I'm like, yeah, th there's a point to that. I understand that. But does that mean that mastering a piece of HDR content to only go up to 200 or 400 nits is fake HDR? Absolutely not. I completely yeah. disagree with that. Jack. Jack says, does the Epson 5050 UB offer frame-by-frame -frame dynamic tone mapping for HDR? No, it okay. does not. <laughs> Normally, the Epson 5050 UB and the BenQ HD 50, 5550 are pretty close in price, but during the Black uh, during all the Black Friday and Cyber Monday sale deals going on, Jack found a good discount on the BenQ. So what are the differences? Too late to tell you now, but we will tell you in the <laughs> Sales are still going. It's Cyber Monday week. Yeah, he's heard that Epson 5050 UB still has deeper black levels than the BenQ uh, HT 5550, but would you only notice that in a pitch black room? He has pretty good light control in this room. It is very dark, but it isn't pitch black. So does that negate the black, the black level advantage of the 5050? I mean, it, it right. certainly can. As soon as you have even a little bit of ambient light with a normal white screen, there's, there's a little bit of washout. You know, your ultimate black level is only... So turn the projector off put the room into the lighting conditions where you would normally have the projector on, look at your screen. If it's anything other than pitch black, well, that is as black as black gets in your setup. And right. as soon as the projector is on, the only thing the black level could potentially do is go up from there. At best, it would stay exactly where it is with the projector off. Uh, normally, it'll go up a little bit. So yeah, if you have even just a little bit of ambient light, it probably negates the black level differences uh, because the BenQ HT 5550, um, if you're not familiar with that model, it is using the 1080p DL chip that they wobble four times per frame. So that's the chip that's in there. And most projectors that use that 1080p times four DLP chip, even the ones that are the new ultra short throw with the laser light engine, because quite a few of those are out now using that chip, it doesn't have the best black levels. Just inherently, that chip doesn't have the best black levels, not equal to the 5050 UB. But BenQ tuned the 5550, which is more expensive than the 3550 that also uses the same chip, but they tuned the 5550, dynamic iris on that thing, um, you know, tuned it up as best as they could. And it has better black levels on that BenQ HT 5550 than pretty much any other projector that uses that same DLP chip, the 1080p times four chip. So it's a darn good example of that DLP chip being used. Not quite as good as the 5050 UB. So the 5050 UB still has a number of features that the BenQ HT 5550 simply does not offer. It does have the slightly better black levels, but you might not notice that. Um, it can get closer to full DCI P3 color. It has a physical filter that goes into the light path. The Epson does, uh, but the BenQ is no slouch. Um, the BenQ goes beyond Rec 709 color, which not a lot of DLPs do. So it's not a slouch. The Epson 5050 does handle HDR better 
it can go brighter than the BenQ. So when you're talking about maybe a little bit of ambient light, the Epson is actually still better. They're not because of the black levels, but because it can go brighter. And then going brighter also helps you in HDR. Also, the Epson handles HDR quite nicely because they give you a button right on the remote that gives you a 16-step slider. So if you want HDR to look brighter or dimmer as a whole, it's very easy to adjust. Whereas the HD5550 essentially has one tone mapping for all HDR content, and it doesn't really look HDR. It doesn't have the ability so epson looks better for hdr and the epson has fully motorized lens including lens memory whereas the lens on the benq is completely manual and it does have vertical and horizontal lens shift which is unusual for a dlp so it's nice that it has it but not as much range and it's manual it has a 1.6 time zoom which is pretty good for a dlp but not as much range and it's manual so the epson has advantages but you might be able to look at all of those things and go, well, I only need to set my lens once and I don't need lens memory. So I don't care that it's manual right. and the adjustments are sufficient. Um, you know, uh, the black levels, I've got a little bit of ambient light, so that's a wash. I don't care that it's a little bit less wide color. So then it comes down to, is it bright enough? And do you want the most HDR pop when you're watching HDR, which the Epson will give you more? That might be the only thing. And if there's a price difference you know, like a thousand dollars difference, I could easily justify the BenQ HD 5550. So those are all the differences. You decide if any of those are important enough to justify the price difference. Sorry, I I just sneeze snuck up on me. Uh-huh. That's quite <laughs> yeah, all right. I, I, I didn't hear the last half of it. I was yapping said, so. away. We made it. All right. It. <clears throat> I'm sure you did a very good job answering that question there. Uh Girl. No, I know. I'm making sure that the podcast published on the Facebook page, and it did. So <laughs> it was. I just didn't get the tweet. I normally get the tweet. All right. Earl says Ar Arthur found the PDF document. Who the heck's Arthur? Uh, and it um, made by oh, PDF. What did I do here? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, there's you know Earl what it is. Um, his email had Arthur as his name, and then he signed it Earl. So that okay. Was, sorry about that. Anyways, we're going all right, Earl. Arthur That's how Earl. We signed it. Right. Earl found the PDF document made by Dolby that is a list of Dolby Atmos receivers. The list includes a column of whether or not each receiver model is Dolby Vision compatible. And in the footnote, it reads, Dolby Vision compatible was created to help identify products that can successfully pass a Dolby Vision input signal through to a display device without compromising the Dolby Vision signal. End that quote. is Dolby's definition. All right. A lot of receiver models listed do not have a yes in the Dolby Vision compatible column, including pretty much all of the current 2019 model year Denon, Marantz, Onkyo, and Yamaha models. So what is going on here? Is this something that needs to be considered when looking for a new receiver? Is no. Yeah. Please <laughs> ignore that list. I don't know what is going on with this. Uh, no, I don't know. I, I'm just, not even going to link to it for everyone else to look at because the only thing it could potentially do is lead people astray. No, I guarantee you that, for example, the Denon X4500H or the Yamaha RXA3080 flagship from 2019 can pass through Dolby Vision just fine. Two AV receiver models that I own where I watch Dolby Vision being passed <laughs> through them. So don't tell me that because they don't have a yes in the call, and they don't. I looked up the models that I own. It's probably just not updated. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it, it's not yeah. updated. I don't know what's, I, in fact, I. And why Why would anybody, I mean, it, it has nothing to do with Den, Den and Morantz and everybody else. It's which chip they bought. Well, yeah. The chip is I, the thing that I passes almost it along. I almost suspect that they only put a yes if it was one of the models that needed a firmware update. That seems to be how yeah, it lines up. Maybe. Except yeah. my Morantz SR70 10 which got Dolby Vision passed through via a firmware update doesn't have a yes in the Dolby Vision column in this PDF table but I watch Dolby Vision being passed through it so I can guarantee you it does so ignore the list entirely don't look at that if you're wondering does the AV receiver model I'm considering buying pass through Dolby Vision if it's a new model the answer is if it's got 2019 yes. at the end of the model in the model That's description right. then you're fine but if you really want to make sure go to the manufacturer's website and it'll say right in the features whether or not it yeah. supports Dolby Vision don't, don't go by this list you should be able to look at the bottom of the box and we'll right. say it'll have, it'll the, have logo the, it, right yeah. there, the logo on it right there logo on it right so back in May, Ankyo announced their TXNR797 and 696 receiver models. The press release said that they are Ankyo's first products to make to under the IMAX Enhanced program. 
Don't ever use that mode. And it it uh, it definitely said right, the title of the press release had in it first products with an S under IMAX enhanced program, and the only two products mentioned are the seven nine seven and the six nine six. So that is exactly the language that was used. Oh, sorry, Earl, <laughs> not Arthur. I so Earl, <laughs> I see it. Earl was under the impression that the 797 would have IMAX enhanced out of the box, while the 696 would get it via firmware update. To his knowledge, none of that ever happened, and he couldn't find any mention of IMAX at all in either the specs or manual for the 696. So would we clarify what's going on here? First of all, you don't want the IMAX enhanced. You don't want it's, IMAX enhanced. It turns really off your base it. management. Yeah, don't do that. Don't turn it on. Don't, if you didn't get it, don't get it right and don't be don't be sad that you didn't get it. anything that turns off base management can burn in a in a witch's fire i don't know what that is exactly i, I don't think it's a fire made of witches but maybe a fire made for witches right so yes but this is burn it. this is essentially moot and useless i i would have you put it out of your mind entirely but to answer the question this is a horribly worded press release because I mean, they don't make it clear at all, but the 696 is not IMAX enhanced. I mean, no, full stop. It's it's not getting it. It was never going to get it. So having the S at products under IMAX, no, it's product. It's hmm. One product is now IMAX enhanced. And also here's another receiver in the same <laughs> but, press release. I, I, would, I would chalk this up to the people who write the press releases aren't always given... Oh, sure. Super. I wouldn't blame this necessarily on the person who wrote the press release. Right. But surely somebody over there at Ankyo dropped the ball when it comes to <laughs> conveying the information. But the 797 was the only one out of these two models that was going to be under IMAX enhanced. And it, that was going to come via a firmware update. And it appears as though that firmware update got released on October 21st. So not that long ago. Uh, but the All 797 right. is now IMAX enhanced. The 696 never will be. Yeah, yeah, no one cares. Don't use IMAX don't enhanced. Don't use it. Don't if you it. can, yeah, don't ever. If you see it on there, on your Just computer. Just let it be I mean, normal the, your, DTS. Throw holy water at your receiver. Not a lot. It's a couple of drops. Just to get rid of it'll, the It'll still evil. be DTS X and it'll still be lovely and it'll have base management and it'll be better than the IMAX enhanced bastardized version of DTS X. Just who thought that was a good idea? <laughs> Who? <laughs> the people who didn't want to use anything Dolby. That's who. <laughs> Andy and Ryan on Twitter. So the new NVIDIA Shield TV models came out. Andy has an older model. He's got it connected to his uh, Denon AVR 1613 via HDMI. And he could have sworn he used to get Discrete 5.1 from certain YouTube videos. He's included a link to one that he sure used to play in Discrete 5.1. And now it seems to only play in stereo audio from YouTube. His Denon's front panel used to say multiple multi-channel multi-channel mm -hmm. which is what it says when it's getting discrete channels rather than uh, some sort of bit stream that's right but now it says dolby pl2 cinema which means it's up mixing right and since he's only uh running 5.1 sp speaker setup it wouldn't be up mixing to discrete 5.1 signal right so can we confirm netflix and amazon prime will still kick his den in into uh, dolby digital plus when he uses those apps on the nvidia shield so can it do 5.1 from youtube or did that change the forums have been a no help so just because something says it's dolby Pro Logic 2 Cinema or Dolby Digital Plus. I mean, it can be encoded that way mm -hmm. as far as, you know, Dolby, uh, well, Pro Logic is usually that it's right. well, I mean, up mixing. It's up, up mixing. The reason I mentioned Digital, that is it's, it's possible to have, like, let's say you're watching a DVD that is for sure yeah. 5.1 Dolby Digital, but you have a 7.1 speaker setup. Dolby yeah. Pro Logic 2 could up mix a 5.1 Dolby digital signal to a 7.1 speaker setup. But Andy just has a 5.1 setup. Right. So if he was getting a 5.1 signal coming out of his NVIDIA shield, there's no way Dolby Pro Logic 2 could be applied to that when he has a 5.1 speaker setup. So it has to be a stereo signal that's coming out of there. Right. He, so this got me looking at it because I was like, uh, I haven't actually used my NVIDIA Shield to watch YouTube in a long time. Yeah, all the 5.1 audio was gone from YouTube. Okay. it's Because there were videos that I watched that kicked my receiver into 5.1 audio mode. And to confirm this, I went to my LG OLED via ARC 
using the YouTube app that's built into my LG OLED, that one actually used to output it as Dolby Digital. I mean, it didn't come out as 5.1 PCM with the TV doing the decoding. The NVIDIA Shield would always decode the audio inside and it would kick it out as 5.1 PCM. But my LG OLED used to just pass through Dolby Digital from YouTube. There is no 5.1 coming out of YouTube anymore. Everything is stereo out of my LG OLED, out of my NVIDIA Shield, out of my NVIDIA Shield Pro. YouTube seems to have banished 5.1. Now, if anybody can tell me concretely that that is not the case, I would love to hear it. But I'm like, uh, no, these are videos that I watched in 5.1 before, and they are in stereo now from devices that for sure used to output it as 5.1. So this seems to be a YouTube thing, Andy. Yeah. There you go. But just because your receiver, let's just back it up a little bit, says multi-channel in or whatever it is. Sure. Does not necessarily mean that you're getting 5.1 or 7.1 mm. or It whatever. means it's a fi like a multi-channel container. It's not a two-channel right. signal could per se. Could be mono. Right. It could be coming out of your center channel and nothing else. Just like how you can have so, it in Dolby Digital, but the Dolby Digital only has one or two channels in it. Yeah. yeah. Dolby Digital doesn't have to mean 5.1. So, in, like, whenever I see multi-channel in like that, uh, a lot of times I'll just walk around my home theater real quick just sure. to see what speakers are actually playing. Because our – and this is so funny. I, I don't remember – we were outside and there was a sound that happened and it was a loud sound and it was from far away and it was from behind me or ish behind me and I heard it and I was like what the heck is that and I turned towards it and the minute I turned towards it I could immediately locate where it was sure. in space in front of me you look at your ears you look at you know how they're how those lobes are angled <laughs> to funnel the sound in sounds coming from behind you just they just aren't that you're not you know, very above good you. at hearing them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can hear them just fine, but you can't locate them right. in space. You know, it's not stereo imaging that you're <laughs> you know that you're used to with your eyes or anything else. When you look at an animal like a dog who can move their ears independently right. a lot of times to a certain extent, that's what they're doing. They're triangulating yeah. that sound that they're hearing. So when people are like, "Oh, I want to make sure that I've got this and that," but you know, is it, you know, should I move my speaker six inches down, dude? Who cares? <laughs> no, I mean, you know, you know, being confused over this and, and the forums being no help. I mean, yeah, because yeah. I mean, there's a ton of YouTube videos that are labeled as Dolby Digital or labeled as 5.1, but they never were. So I yeah. mean, that was people uploading stuff and not realizing that, you know, it took more than that and then just putting it in the title. So there was that side of things. Then the NVIDIA Shield is getting updates all the time. So I was like, oh, maybe it's possible. Maybe some firmware update, you know, right. for whatever reason. But I'm like, no, my LG OLED <laughs> was definitely via ARC outputting 5.1 and uh, now but I thought NVIDIA Shield never could do 5.1 no, from The YouTube. NVIDIA Shield was the only external box that could output 5.1 audio from YouTube. It was the okay, only one. Right. No other external box could do it. I mean, that was the advantage. It never supported HDR from YouTube, but it could do 5.1 audio. That, um, it was the only external box that could. But I'm like, yeah, the videos that used to be in 5.1, they themselves are now in stereo. So this is a YouTube thing, Andy. All right. Ryan tried Rob's suggestions of setting his NVIDIA Shield Pro's display mode to 4K, 23.976 frames per second, Rec 2020, but now it seems really choppy and moving around the interface seems laggy. Is there something additional he should change in the setup using his Sony X900E TV? If, he, if he's okay with manually switching back and forth between the 23.976 and 59.94 frames per second, will that look better? And what about the AI... Uh, AI upscaling they've been touting and praising. So I don't know what the heck this is about. Right. It sounds like there's some processing going on that's making everything well, slow down. But I mean, if you've ever experimented by putting your PC into 24 hertz mode and looking at that on your screen, it, it looks all choppy and the animations are not the least bit smooth, which you might interpret as looking laggy. I mean, that's just kind of what happens when you make your frame rate that low. Uh, so that is, that is normal, Ryan. That is absolutely what it looks like when... All the time, even in just the menu, it's outputting at 24, 23.976 frames per second. It, it just, it does, it, it chops. The animations aren't the least bit smooth. It, it looks pretty bad. I leave it there because almost all the video that I'm streaming is in 23.976. It's in 24 frames a second. Um, mm. And as I mentioned before, the match frame rate option, if your default is 60 or 59.94, and then you use the match frame rate option to try and get it to kick down to 24, 
it, it doesn't work very well. It's not reliable at all. So I, on my default, I leave it at the 24, the 23.976. And if the piece of content I'm watching is in 60, I can use that match frame rate option and kicking it up seems to work pretty, pretty well. That, that part okay. seems to work okay. So that was my recommendation. But if moving around the interface is just too ugly for you and you're willing to manually switch back and forth, then yeah, that, that's how it's going to look the best. You know, you, you leave it at 60 frames per second for most of the time when you're watching YouTube, when you're in the interface. Did you warn people that the menu is going to be like all... Sh- I didn't do a good job mess- of warning people. Nope, I didn't warn yeah. people. I didn't all right, that's our bad. I just, that's our bad. It's my bad. I, I just live with it because I want non-judder video and I'll live with everything else looking ugly. But if you are playing any games on it, of course you'd want to switch it to 60 for that. So yeah, if you're willing to switch back and forth, that's okay. The AI upscaling. I haven't had a ton of time to look at it. Of course, if the content is in 4K, it doesn't touch it. That's good. So that does nothing. If the content is in standard definition, it doesn't touch it. I mean, other than it's normal upscaling, but the AI upscaling doesn't touch standard definition. So whatever. So it's basically 1080p content. And for what I've watched, which admittedly is a small sampling size, but it looks like it's doing a very good job. Uh, It does look sharp. Uh, with that AI upscaling. So I am totally fine leaving it on. If I were to watch something and notice artifacts in it, it's really the quick menu and toggling it off. So if you're willing to switch frame rates, toggling AI upscaling on and off is certainly not difficult. And I'm fine with leaving it on as the default. Says, uh, just in general, do we agree that it's gotten way too hard to know exactly what is... What exactly is supposed to happen with any given piece of content? What exactly is it supposed to look and sound like? And what modes are your TV receiver and other any other gear supposed to automatically kick into? And what do you do if they don't automatically kick into the best mode? Is it honestly the is he honestly the only one feeling this way, or is he not alone in feeling the feelings that things have gotten more complicated and more and difficult to completely understand? Okay, so this is a uh, this is probably the same thing that was said when. Uh, HD came out. Sure. And, uh, you know, you know, this is the sort of, the you know, these conversations that we're having whenever we switch to a new format or as, you know, resolutions change on TVs or whatever, you know, these new, these new content things come out, there's these growing pains mm-hmm. where, you know, the TV manufacturers and, you know, there's always a, a format war of some sort kind of brewing in the background, you know, <laughs> oh, Dolby Vision or HDR or, you know, HDR 10 plus or, you know, whatever. Uh, there was, wasn't there like cinema something? There was another person or who was it? that had their own thing for five and a half oh, seconds. Oh, well, the Technicolor? Technicolor HDR? Technicolor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's always like, you know, some things going on. So as, because remember, these TVs that we're buying right now, these receivers that we're buying right now, they were in development two, three years ago. Yes. Minimum. So, you know, they're trying as best they can to get the <laughs> newest, you know, the latest, greatest parts in uh, upscalers and codecs and everything else in there, but they're always shoehorning some of these th- things in at the last minute, and it's always a little clunky until the, mat- the the technology matures enough where basically the manufacturing part, that, that, that cycle can catch up to where the technology, where we're all, exp- you're all like at home going, what are you talking about? Blue, you know, Ultra HD Blu-ray has been out for a year and a half, two years now, three years, something like that. How come we're, you know, only, you know, how come my TV doesn't automatically switch into HDR mode and do all these other things? Well, <laughs> two and a half years ago when they were developing that TV, the you standards know, they weren't had, all there. Yeah, <laughs> not yet. Yeah, the standards weren't all over there. Over there, a lot of times, the the, the part that was going to go into this TV was a spec sheet that they said it will be ready in time. Work off of the spec sheet. And we're like, all right, we'll do our best, you know. And that's why these firmware updates end, end up having to come out. So, oh, yeah. no. you're, you're not incorrect in that right now everything's clunky. No, and I, mean, I 100% Andy, agree I, with I you. I completely. I mean, so. Just look at this podcast. I mean, this podcast should be like 45 minutes long each week and we should have barely any questions because everything's been answered. But no, we're still going strong and not even getting to every question in a two hour long podcast every week because things have gotten more. I mean, so when we had DVD, right, we had what? We had DTS 5.1, maybe right. 6.1. We had Dolby Digital. Everything was in standard definition on DVD. 
maybe you had to put your TV into movie mode or something right, if you weren't going to calibrate or whatever, right? But, like, that was about it, right? But, but back then we had to worry about, uh, you know, DVDs properly doing 3-2 pull-downs or TVs <laughs> properly right. doing 3-2 pull-downs. We got we into worried progressive a lot scan, more. enhanced Progressive definition. scan came out, and then we worried about uh, calibrating TVs. One thing, I mean, that none of – that you're – you're, you're really not uh, addressing here is we no longer talk about calibrating TVs or displays of any kind. Oh, we talk that about is some. <laughs> oh, yeah. And every single time we talk about it, we're like, yeah, you can do it. But really, if you do these three steps, you're 90% of the way there. Everybody agrees <laughs> or that. Or just hire t- a calibrator. <laughs> Well, you would have to at yeah. this point. You almost, in order to get it the extra, you know, five or ten percent right. to perfect, you have to hire a calibrator who has got a twenty thousand dollar light meter sure. in order to get to get it there. Back then, I mean, TVs came out with wild. I mean, like movie mode yes. didn't mean anything. I mean, we were, you know, talking about going through the THX discs, you know, and because they had a they had like a movie mode calibrator in the back or not yeah. movie mode, but you know, you the, TV the basic and setup, audio user calibrator. menu yeah. setup. Yeah, and you know, there were. Different differences between DVD players because of progressive scan and 3-2 pull down yeah. and stuff. But it's gotten even worse, right? Because, I mean, we didn't have HDR back then. We didn't have Atmos. We didn't have DTSA. We didn't have Oro 3D that is, you know, floating around out there. We didn't have different HDR formats. We didn't have Rec. 709 versus Rec. 2020. We didn't have 23.976 hertz versus 59.94 hertz. I mean, like, it has gotten more complicated, Andy. There is no question about it. And, I mean, yes, you take a darn good you go buy a lg oled you go buy a flagship sony or a flagship samsung you take it out of the box and you at least do the step that a lot of people wouldn't do to put it into movie mode or cinema mode or isf mode right again right look at all the options just there but you do that much and then you plug in your xbox one x uh, still at the moment, the most advanced video game system, and you're like, hey, it's also an Ultra HD Blu-ray player. Awesome. This is going to look fantastic, right? And you're like, you plug it all in, you press play, and it's like, well, it, it does probably look great, but we've analyzed what the Xbox One X does as an Ultra HD Blu-ray player, and because inside of the Xbox One X, it takes the bits off the disc, it converts it into RGB, which has to happen at some point, but usually the player doesn't do it. But the Xbox One X does. It converts it into RGB. It used to just output it that way, which would mean that your black levels were off in your TV most of the time. So then they issued a firmware update, so they convert it back into YCBCR, but they don't do it quite right. So there's a little bit of noise in the dark areas all the time on an Xbox One X. It's like, so how are you supposed to know that if you're not an insane person like me, right? You're absolutely right. It's gotten nuts where you can't even trust that plugging in two flagship devices to each other is going to give you what you're supposed to see. And you have to have done this ridiculous amount of research to figure out what's going on. So no, you are not alone. You are absolutely right, Andy. I think it is a bit ridiculous, but hey, it keeps this podcast going. (laughs) 2021 TV projector models. We will not be talking about uh, HDR... And, you know, really and, uh, I, 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 we will talk. We'll talk. We'll be talking. It's going to be 8K. Vi- well, that's just what I'm saying. We will not be talking about whether or not it switches into the correct mode and whether or not the, you know, there'll be some models, that, like the base models that won't be doing the HDR conversion correctly, but most of, most everything will be handling all this stuff right. We'll have other things to talk about. Mm-hmm. We will. There'll be 8K, you know, models out there'll there. There'll probably be some HDCP nonsense going on. Almost right. certainly kick into things. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, as far as like what you're talking about, as far as you know, your now I I have no faith that Microsoft will ever get video slash audio correct. I have no idea how a company <laughs> as large as Microsoft with a with which is essentially a pers- a, a flagship personal computer in a box that they control can't get audio and video working properly in a timely manner Mm -hmm. and i know my xbox one now seems to suddenly be doing 5.1 correctly it's been like what seven years five years (laughs) something like that it's ridiculous within this question we were just talking about the nvidia shield pro i mean uh, i i'm a bit loath to even put this out there but i've noticed that when i have it in the mode that is compatible with both hdr 10 and dolby vision the only way to do that is as a 12-bit output signal, not 10-bit. Uh-huh. It the, the only choice is 12-bit. And I've noticed that with it in that mode, it appears as though the NVIDIA Shield Pro is doing a similar thing to the Xbox One X where it is first 
uh, uh, decoding everything into RGB and then putting it into this 12-bit container. And you can see a little bit of noise in the deepest, darkest black sometimes that shouldn't be there and isn't there when you put it into 10-bit mode, but in 10-bit mode, you can't get Dolby Vision. So yay, you know? I mean, <laughs> this is what's I'm, going I'm on. I'm watching my dog clean herself you while you're talking about this 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 in, in insanity. Uh, yeah, you know, there's, there's always going to be issues, but, you know, we no longer talk about whether or not your receiver can uh, recognize a proper audio signal as it comes in. That's, you know, it's sure. something that it just does. You know, passing through used to be a huge issue, no longer a but huge issue. But then you've issue. got things like, you know, your uh, the way the Xbox One first did Atmos, where your AV receiver said Atmos all the time, regardless yeah. of what the original content was. Now, but again, that, we're that talking about Microsoft. And Microsoft has shown itself to be completely in <laughs> incapable of doing anything correctly. But they're not the only, than... I mean, when the Apple TV 4K first came out, if you put it in Dolby Vision mode, everything was Dolby Vision all the yeah. time. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. no, yeah, it's it's complicated and silly, and it is difficult to know what it is actually supposed to look like. Uh, but I guess you're going to keep asking us, because we'll answer. A couple of years from now, I think these these exact kind of questions of whether or not my devices are switching into the right mode right. are going to be far, 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 far. I less. hope so. One would yeah, hope. Mike, now that Mike has a pretty good grip on his DIY acoustic tr treatment pan plans, oh, he'd like to know what we suggest to do about the empty space left in the niche to the right side of his room. He's got a shelf on that niche to hold his Xbox One and maybe a network switch and a few other small items. So he, he only needs the upper portion of the niche for shelves, leaving pretty big cavity at the bottom. So there's this, yeah, it's it's at the right side of his it's room. On the right-hand side, yeah. Yeah, he's got a little. He's got his surround speaker to the right of this niche. He's got his Xbox One in there and a bunch of cables, and the bottom of it is empty. <laughs> his intention is to have wainscoting around the base of his walls, and he planned on making his the panel sections of that wainscoting using acoustic, acoustically transparent fabric, so that they, it can house insulation for acoustic absorption purposes. So for the bottom cavity of his niche, do we think he should close it up with a solid piece of drywall and then just put his wainscoting over it? Or should, would uh, it would still have a thin piece of insulation just like the rest of his walls? Or should he fill the whole cavity with insulation and hide it with the wainscoting? The niche is 23 inches deep and 15 inches wide. I would fill that bad boy with insulation top yep. to bottom. Fill it up. <laughs> nice little base trap in there, buddy. Absolutely. It, yeah, I would fill it top to bottom. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because if you just throw a piece I would... of drywall over there, you still got a cavity in behind it, and yeah. it's not as though that shelf is like completely acoustically inert. So you have like yeah. a like yeah, imagine that thing just becomes like a resonating <laughs> like a thump on it, like a drum. Yeah. No, no, fill it yeah. up with insulation, dude. Yeah. If you fill the top up with it, but you know if you want to put you know some <laughs> Above, fabric across yeah. the top and put another shelf up there and sure. just stack that up with insulation, why not? That's just a big base trap. Sure. Knock yourself out. Yeah. Tony, on Tony's receiver, it, it, if he goes up into its setup menu it, and selects input, one of the options is source level. Could we explain what that setting does and how it should be set? He turned his up to plus 12 and it made everything louder. Mm -hmm. Shocking nobody. <laughs> but does that negatively affect his Odyssey EQ settings or could it potentially damage his speakers? Well, it can only potentially damage his speakers if you're hearing it damage your speakers. Yeah, you I mean, also know. turn the master volume up until it starts to uh, get crazy, crazy loud. Uh, but it yeah. does... So, okay, yeah, this uh, source level setting that is in there, and a lot of AV receivers have this, it is a setting, it does depend what source is active before you press the setup menu button, right? So you've got your right. Blu-ray input, your cable sat box input, your CD <coughs> input, right? You actually have to select what input first, then press setup menu, and that right. source level setting is input dependent. It, it is unique to each input. So a lot of times in this podcast, people have asked us, you know, what volume level do we use? And a lot, our answers are almost always, well, it depends on which source or which wh where we're getting right. our information from. Yeah. Even through the Xbox One, when I'm watching YouTube, I'm down at negative 30. Mm. When I'm watching a movie, I'm up at minus five. You know, so there's a huge difference there. But if you have a cable box, mm -hmm. a, a, a Blu-ray player, an sure. Ultra HD Blu-ray player, and a game system sure. like the Switch, you may say to yourself, I want all of these so that the master volume level 
stays the same as I switch from source to source. Yes. For me, I know when I switch to YouTube, I immediately put the volume down. Nobody else in my house knows that, but I know it. My <laughs> kids kind of have it figured out, but not exactly. I, sometimes I'll come in here and they'll be so soft. I'm like, what's going on? And then other times they'll be blasting. And it's because you know they were watching a movie and then they switched to YouTube. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it's super loud. What you can do is go to the source that you're worried about and say, this one is always you know at about a minus 30. And I want it to be, you know, when at that same sort of uh, volume, I want it to be at a minus 10 or something. Sure. Well, let, let's say uh, minus 20. So you say, okay, I'll go down. For that one uh, source. For that one source. this one 10, source that I use is always louder than my other sources. Right. So I'll turn it down 10 dB so that it this what was negative 30 is now negative 20. Sure. Okay, so now it's negative 20. Then you go to your cable box. Your cable box at what is that same comfortable volume level is usually a minus 10. You're like, okay, I'm going to take that source and turn it up to yep. plus 10. Now, when you turn on negative 20, it's the same relative volume at your ears as your uh, whatever the other thing I said was, yeah. Blu-ray player or whatever yeah. it was. So this so. is my cable box is always quieter than my Apple TV 4K or vice versa, whatever it is. Right. This is so that when you press your source input button uh, to switch between hardware sources, source devices on your AV receiver, uh, you can leave the master volume where it is and from source to source, they sound the same. Now, what Tom mentioned about, you know, using an Xbox One and you're switching apps... Right? That's so you, that's where the, this is completely useless. This, this doesn't help you there. You haven't switched your hardware source device. It's still the Xbox One, but from app to app, there are different volumes. Your AV receiver source level menu can't help you with that. But right. if your Xbox One in general, the, the only thing you use it for is playing games, and your games are always louder than your cable box, well, you could use the source level for whatever HDMI input your Xbox One is plugged into. You turn down the source level on that, and maybe on the cable box, you turn up the source level, and and now your master volume stays the same all the time, and your cable box and your Xbox One games sound the same volume now. That's what it's for. Yeah. Uh, will it hurt your Odyssey EQ? Nope. Uh, no, will sure. it damage no. your speakers? Not if you've leveled everything out and you leave your master volume at a normal you know, level. Yeah, I mean, it, it, all you're doing is basically changing where you know the, the master volume sort of baseline on yeah. there. That's well, it's like doing. saying the signal that's coming in is too quiet or too loud, so now yeah. I'm leaving it out. That's what that's for. So get on this receiver, if he goes into setup and then the audio, there's an option uh, there for subwoofer level adjust. This is separate from the subwoofer trim level that is found under the manual speaker settings. So what is that subwoofer level adjust for and how should it be set? He wanted to goose his bass a bit, so he set it to plus six. But is that correct? Well, it's correct if it sounds right to you. So let's go with that. But uh, subwoofer level adjust, is that source dependent as well? Because I, th th I think that's... some receivers it is, yes, because so, this is not I, I, under the speaker settings menu. This is under I feel like the this is a audio menu. on my receiver. It's more of a general like it just boosts up your subwoofer. Well, it's the subwoofer pre out. It just yeah adjusts the gain on the subwoofer pre out, yeah. but separate from the speaker setup, what Odyssey set, let's say, or what right. Wipeout set, or something like that. So. The reason that this is here is, okay, you've run Odyssey, if you run Wild Power, whatever your auto setup is, or you've manually set your speaker levels, your trim levels manually, and you're like, okay, this is where my subwoofer output level should be so that it is at reference volume. That's, that's where it should be. But I go to a particular source and its bass is always too loud or its bass is always too quiet. So under the audio menu, that's where you can adjust the subwoofer level adjust. It's separate from the speaker trim level. And for some receivers, it's input dependent again, just like the source level adjust. Uh, for some, it's sort of universal, but it allows you to boost or cut the gain of your subwoofer pre-out independent of the actual trim level settings. So what's nice there is you can always get back to reference, right? Right, just you by going to zero. Just by yeah. setting the subwoofer level adjust to zero. So it's sort of a, uh, a secondary gain adjustment for the subwoofer pre-out so that you can like, I can goose it a bit now, but if I want to get back to reference, I didn't have to change my actual Odyssey settings or my Yeah, or you don't have to remember That's what right. you did. Like if Odyssey set it to minus three, you're not like, oh, where did it, what was it? Three. Right. Or, Something like that. All right, we'll do one more, then we got to okay. be done. 
Damien, now that Damien has ordered his Ascend acoustic speakers for his theater, what would we say is his best option for surround speaker placement? His HTM 200 SCs could go on the side walls just a little behind his front row of seats, but in front of his back row with the tweeters just a little above his seated ear height, or he could put them on pivot wall mounts and angle them from positions just behind his back row of seats with the tweeters up higher. What do we say? Uh, how much do you care about that second row? That's the real question. <laughs> yeah. Because if you don't care that much about the second row, then I would definitely take the first option and place them optimally for the first for the row. For the front row, yes. It, it, the, yeah, we often come up with, a, you know, like I'm going to have a, a home theater, it's going to have all these chairs and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then, you know, we have people over all the time, we're going to watch movies. And 99% of the time, those extra chairs are not used. Yeah, it's one so, or two people sitting in yeah. the front row. Yeah. And that's going to be it. So I would most of the time say, set up your speakers for how the 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 theater should be for the, the majority of its use case. And if you decide to have people over, you give them the good seats. That's what you do. You give them the good seats, you go sit in the second row of seats, and you let them enjoy the movie the way that you know that you would want them to enjoy it. And if there's a bunch of people over, and uh, you know a lot of them are kids or whatever, most of them aren't going to care anyways. I mean, I went and saw It with a friend of mine, and it was in a Dolby Digital, whatever, Dolby Atmos Theater, with a million speakers everywhere, and we sat in the back left corner outside of the line of Atmos speakers. Right. Well, you know, the back left to the left of the line of Atmos speakers. He was like, man, it sounded great. I'm like, no, it didn't. What are you insane? It sounded terrible. <laughs> you know, all, you could hear all that overhead stuff. And because my ears were pointed at it, I could hear them all going in front of me. I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> fantastic. Wow, I wish I was underneath some of that. Uh, most of them aren't going to care anyway. Right. So do what's right for the majority of the use case. I would put them so for the front row because that's where yep. I would sit. On and the then... side walls, just slightly behind the front row. Yeah, totally agree. And if it turns out you have people over all the time, buy a second sure. set, wire, the, wire them in, right. series, yeah, in series. And then and then uh, you put a second set right behind that where that second that second thing was. And you can do that you know, when you decide, hey, we have people over so much, we need to have a set, make sure that everybody has good surround. I really want to give Tom T an answer. Can we make that the last one? Damien's was quick. Dude, I'm so tired. Uh, Tom. Tom would like to use a 4K TV as a computer monitor. He'll mostly be using it for software development, but also for some gaming now and then. He would like some recommendations for a 43, 55, and something in between. His max budget is 1500 bucks. He needs It needs to be UHD resolution support 4.4. 444. 4, 4, 4. 4. 4. What the heck? 444 4, 4 input and have at least a 60 hertz panel refresh rate, even though he owns and loves his OLED TV. Uh, for this computer monitor, he does not want an OLED. He would appreciate HDR support, variable refresh rate, free sync or G-Sync, and wide viewing angles, but it would not be a deal breaker if the TV did not have these niceties. What do we suggest? Without even knowing what Rob's going to say, since he doesn't want OLED and he wants the weird refresh rates, it's right. Samsung, right? Oh, that's going to be the top choice. Uh, my top choice for you would be Samsung's Q70. Um, now, it does not come in a 43-inch size. There's a 49-inch size and a 55-inch size. <laughs> uh, but there are some things to be aware of. The 55-inch size of the Q70, it's a 120 hertz panel, and it has variable refresh rate. In fact, it has free sync, and it is G-Sync compatible. So it's like all the variable refresh rate options, but only at the 55-inch size. The 49-inch size is a 60 hertz panel, and it does not have free sync. So that is something to be aware of. The 55-inch size gives you all the things. But overall, even the 60, uh, the 49-inch uh, size with the 60 hertz panel is a darn good choice in that Q70. It's full array local dimming uh, on that. Now, there is the Q80 on sale right now. Uh, the 55-inch is the smallest size in the Q80 lineup. So no option for 49 or 43 there. <laughs> About the only reason I might point you there is because it has a much better anti-reflective screen. But if that isn't yeah. a concern to you, then stick with the Q70. So are there 43-inch options because you wanted something? Well, there's kind of not that many options at 43 that I would consider a, like pretty good. I would probably point you to Vizio's M Quantum because at least that gets you full array local dimming. No variable refresh rate. Uh, I think that's actually a 120 hertz panel in that M Quantum. Uh, but... It's a 43-inch option with full array local dimming. You could look at the Samsung Q60, but that's edge lit, so 
If it's Oof. 43, I'd probably go the Vizio M Quantum. Neither of them is great for HDR, but they're both HDR compatible at the 43 inch size. Uh, so let's say he really wants a 49 incher that does do FreeSync. Uh, you'd have to go back a model year, but Samsung's NU8000 is like one of the only 49 inch monitors out there that does FreeSync. It's a 60 Hertz panel, but it does FreeSync. But it's the NU8000, not the new RU8000. And uh, it's edge lit. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if you're like, I want one that does Dolby vision. Cause none of the ones I mentioned, well, the M, the M quantum does Dolby vision, the Vizio M quantum, uh, Sony's X 900 F would be the other option. It does come in both 49 and 59 inch sizes, but not 43. Even the 49 inch is 120 Hertz. So if you're like, Hey, I want Dolby vision. I want 120 Hertz. I want 49 inches. The Sony X 900 F might be the way to go. No variable refresh rate, but, uh, other than that, it's a pretty darn good choice. So yeah, there you go. Probably the Q7. All these are in the price range. All of these hit the, are within the price range. Yeah. All right. So probably the Q70, maybe the Vizio M Quantum if you want the smallest size, and uh, the X900F from Sony is a darn good option, uh, especially if 49 is what you want and you're okay with no variable refresh rate. All right. Who's left? We have Andrew and Nathan, and I believe that's it. Yeah, Andrew and Nathan, you are on the list for next week. So let's take like our listeners of the week. Uh, we're gonna thank Raf. Full. I'm Raff just gonna go with Raf. Thank you, Raf. And Raf and our 92 <laughs> patrons, including Jack and Andy over at Patreon.com for supporting the podcast financially, as well as Mike for sending us Amazon gift cards. Thank you, Raf. Patreons, patrons, including Jack and Andy and Mike. Yeah, that's right. Patreon.com slash podcast. If you'd like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation, let's get that up to 100. We have a prize draw that is uh, kindly being donated by Andrew L. Get yourself a very cool looking si-fi themed model that he is building. Just an example that he gave us of the USS Defiant. We, from should, we need to get Deep like Space a list Nine. of what, what he could, what, what are the options? Right, right. So maybe, maybe he, he will listen and send that to us. But in any case, uh, yeah, get, get us up to 100 because it's not until we reach 100 that we'll do that prize draw. So incentivized, that's, that's what's happened there. But thanks to our 92 patrons. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Andy, for being among our patrons. Thank you, Raph, for donating. Thank you, Mike, for the gift card. I want to thank Damien for talking us up to Ascend in a grinder for, uh, did I say that? Yes, right? grinder. Grinder? Gr I don't know. I'm so tired. Uh, for... <laughs> Uh, what did he talk about? Aluna Vision or Aluna Vision. I always put it uh, right. in there, but yes, uh, Grinder, thank you. And Damien, thank you as well. Thanks for talking us up to those uh, companies. <laughs> for AV Rants, I'm Tom Andrew. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Once your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com. AV Rant. Now go out and listen to something.